Well, good afternoon. My name is Gene Axius. I'm the Senior Vice President for Thought Leadership and International Affairs. We are excited to host the first of three workshops here in our wonderful ARP headquarters. I have the great pleasure and honor of introducing our AARP Chief Executive Officer, Joanne Jenkins. As CEO of AARP, Joanne leads the world's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization, harnessing the power and the passion of nearly 2,000 staff from across the country, 60,000 volunteers, and numerous strategic partners to serve AARP's 38 million members and their families. Since becoming a uh, CEO, Joanne has been on a mission to change the conversation in this country and around the world about what it means to actually grow older, to help people realize their real possibilities, and to find pragmatic and innovative solutions to the challenges people face every day. Her best-selling book, Disrupt Aging, A Bold New Path to Living Your Best Life at Every Age, has become a signature rallying cry for revolutionizing society's views on aging by driving a new social consciousness and sparking innovative solutions for all generations. Joanne is a leader that inspires many, including myself. She is a recognized as a fearless champion for innovation, a visionary and global thought leader, a catalyst for breakthrough results, and a driver of social change that will impact the way we all live and age. And more recently, she was named by Fortune magazine as one of the world's 50th, fifth, excuse me, as one of the world's 50 greatest leaders. I could go on. I could go on for hours listing all of her accomplishments and accolades, but I will not do that in the interest of time. But please join me in welcoming our AARP Chief Executive Officer and the co-chair of the International Oversight Board, Joanne Jenkins. That was such a nice introduction. I think I'll just leave it at that and say, are there any questions? No. Thank you all for coming uh, today. It's so uh, good to see so many friends in the audience here and so many new faces. And I'm told that we have over 500 people who have signed in uh, through Watch through the web services. So uh, welcome to all of you as well. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jean for that kind introduction. And I also want to thank Dr. Victor Zhao and the National Academy of Medicine for choosing healthy longevity as the focus of our grand challenge. You know, as uh, the CEO of AARP, I have the privilege of leading an organization, as Gene said, of representing over 38 million people over the age of uh, 50 and their families. And we strive to ensure that they, and in fact, every American can enjoy the benefits of healthy longevity. After all, aging is not something that just happens to us when we get old, it starts happening to us from the day we were born. As we know, people today are living longer than ever before. And in the U.S., we've added over 25 years of life expectancy since the 1900s, which reflects a similar trend that we see all around the world. And in fact, fact, global aging may be the only trend on which there is complete and total agreement. There are no naysayers in a world where consensus on any issue is increasingly rare. There is sweeping consensus on the simple but powerful truth that the world is aging fast and just about everywhere. But whether those extra years will be good ones or whether societies and economies around the world will benefit as a result depends on the actions that we all together uh, will make in the future. AARP believes it's time for us to, to disrupt aging. We want to change the conversation in this country about what it means to grow older. Our goal is to challenge those outdated beliefs and stereotypes and spark new solutions so more of us know how we want to live and how we want to age. And that is so important for how we talk about aging and longevity in the future. 
three themes run through this disrupt aging conversation. One, we know we can't do this along. We have to br bring all of society with us. There is a public role for government at all levels, at national, state, and local levels. There's a private role for businesses and organizations. And there's a personal role that each of us has to play in taking responsibility for our own aging uh, and health issues. And the National Academies work with AARP is a perfect example of this. Second, we have to continue on our push for innovation. Innovation is key to both our individual successes as well as societal efforts to disrupt aging, not just in terms of the products and services, but also how we create and how we deliver our social structures and programs, not just here in the U.S., but indeed all around the world. And third, disrupt aging is not just about people over the age of 50. It affects people of all generations and people of all generations need to get involved to make this change happen, to make healthy longevity the norm, not the exception. So as the, the co-vice chair of the International Oversight Board for the Global Roadmap on Healthy Longevity, I want to challenge all of you, and especially the members of the commission, with this challenge. I think all of us here recognize that research plays an important role in determining how we age by developing evidence-based interventions that can make life changes better. So the challenge I have for each of you is to use the information, the research, and the knowledge we all have about healthy longevity to create new products and services that enhance this healthy, healthy longevity. And I also want to challenge you to join me and my colleagues at AARP to be more disruptive, but in a kind way, and challenge the outdated stereotypes and attitudes and spark new solutions so more of us can choose how we want to live as we age. I want to, again, welcome all of you to AARP and thank you for bringing your expertise and your wisdom and your commitment to creating this global roadmap for healthy longevity. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Victor Zhao. Uh, he indicated to me that he wanted to, for me to keep it short, but I am a big fan. So uh, I will uh, share a little bit of background about uh, Dr. Zhao. Uh, Dr. Zhao is currently the president of the National Academy of Medicine. He is an internationally acclaimed leader and scientist who whose work has improved health and medicine in the United States and globally. Uh, since arriving at the National Academies, Dr. Zhao has led important initiatives, such as the creation of the Healthy Longevity Global Grand Challenge that includes the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity. He also serves as the Vice Chair of the National Research Council and co-chairs uh, on the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council of Longevity uh, with Dr. Deborah Whitman, uh, the Chief of Public Policy Officer here at AARP. In addition to his numerous awards and accomplishments, uh, Victor has served as the Chancellor for Health Affairs and the President and CEO of Duke University Health System. Please welcome uh, National Academy of Medicine President and the Chair of the International, International Oversight Board for the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity, Dr. Victor Zhao. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, very much indeed. I want to begin by thanking Joanne Jenkins and really such generous host to provide us with the right environment, a beautiful facility, and of course, a great venue for interaction discussion as we think about where we want to go with health and longevity. So thank you very much indeed. Joanne, you're a leader in this whole field. We look to you for many guidance and thank you for being a co-chair of the oversight board of this particular initiative. So I also, of course, want to thank ALP, Deborah Whitman, whom I spent a few days with in Dubai together. Just came back yesterday. She asked me if I'm tired. I said, come on. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Jin Axis, Erwin Tang, and many others. And importantly, CC Shah and Ayana Ogawa and my staff for putting this together. So um, I want to first tell you who we are. Many of you do know. 
and why we're doing this. Uh, we're the National Academy of Medicine, which used to be known as Institute of Medicine. As you see, some of the logos around we found 50 years ago. Our parent organization is National Academy of Sciences, which was founded in 1863 by Abraham Lincoln, chartered by Congress for us to advise the government, and of course advise the nation, and more globally now. So we're not a part of a government organization. We are, in fact, an academy. But we've been very fortunate to look at our mission as being that of advising the nation with evidence base. Our vision statement is better health for all. And now that sums it up. So if you think about what we're talking about today, clearly all includes the whole entire life course, which we strongly believe in. Now, when I first took over the position some five years ago, my counsel and I, the equivalent of our board, discussed about the need to find an area which can inspire people and work together collectively, not only in the scientific, academic, uh, academic community, but also private sector. So some kind of public-private partnership to address a major issue, set an audacious goal, and through a series of different, shall we say, evaluation, et cetera, we actually focus on aging. And importantly, we decided it's healthy longevity. And that's what the history behind the Grand Challenge. And what I'd like to do is spend the next few minutes telling you about what is this Grand Challenge, particularly what is this roadmap, and what we hope to accomplish uh, going forward. So, yeah, this is a slide to this learned audience, I don't need to spend no more time, except it does have a, convey a very important message. If you look at the number of people over 65, you can see the trend on the uh, left-hand side, left, your right-hand your right side, it's just going upwards like this, right? By 2050, 20% of the global population will be over 65. That's close to 2 billion, that population. If you look at the other part of the curve, which is... Uh, the number of people under age five, you can see that trend is going downwards. And in fact, even as we speak, the two lines are crossing each other, which means very shortly we have more people over 65 like me than those like my grandchildren, less than five. This is a trend, as Joanne said, it's not disputed. It is the right, you know, what's going on. And the fertility rate globally is going down. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, which gives you the demographic pyramid, if you will, you can see that we've gone from one, which is a big base of younger people, to maybe 2050, even a rectangle. These trends are very important because they both present challenges and opportunities. And as someone would describe this, that people of my population, as a tsunami, I see it as a positive way of having a silver tsunami. But I think we all recognize that these are great opportunities, but at the same time of concern to society in different ways. This slide simply focuses on what exactly is it. And many already know, and I won't spend any time going over this, except suffice to say, chronic diseases are going to be on the rise. Healthcare delivery and financing system will be challenged. Certainly family structure and relationships and social infrastructure, which is being discussed at this meeting today. And of course, economic, social insurance, retirement programs, and implication workforce. I think the question for all of us, and I know that many of you travel the world, and I know Joanne, your AAP footprint is everywhere, is to ask people, are we prepared? And according to at least two studies I'm aware of, the CSIS Global Aging, Preparedness Index, and the Help Age International simply says if we look at all the countries across the globe, uh, most, if not all, are unprepared. Some do better in one area, but are missing many others. So the real importance is to preparing us financially, socially, and scientifically for a longer lifespan in the global, it's a global imperative. Now, as we look at realizing the longevity dividend, as we all know, that when you go older, you get wiser, happier. There's lots of things we can contribute to society. I think the issue is being able to provide the right environment, 
the right policy and practice to enable for older people, or even as we age, to be healthier and more productive. And we see this as kind of these domains listed here, which is um, certainly, as you said, Joanne, science and innovation is going to be a great part of a solution. Clinical medicine and healthcare, personal, social, economic, environmental, and, and uh, determinants, and of course, policy and practice that cuts across all of the above, and financing as well. For that reason, we thought that we would launch the grand challenge to look at the following. As you see in the top line, it actually defines what we believe a grand challenge is, an audacious goal that can mobilize and inspire people to act. And that's what we hope that we'll do in putting forward this grand challenge. Our thoughts will be to look at the challenges and opportunities presented by a global aging population, address the social, economic, political, and other environmental factors, but also mobilize research, science, and breakthroughs, whereby we have transformative and scalable innovation and create a ecosystem, a dynamic network of support for people as we age. So in that context, uh, we're very happy to tell you that, in fact, 21st of October, we launch the Grand Challenge, first looking at the competition, and today we're looking at, in fact, the roadmap. So what's a roadmap? What's a competition? The roadmap is what we can be doing. Create a comprehensive assessment in, from an international perspective. We deliberately make this international commission because we want to get the best minds and solutions together, learning from each other to do a comprehensive analysis of the issues and to find collective solutions. The hope is that we will be able to provide a series of recommendations globally which can be contextualized in different countries. The competition, which I will not have time to talk about, is our effort to increase innovation because, at least in my world, as a physician scientist, I see not sufficient number of people entering the field of working with longevity or aging. When I go through a medical campus, I can say to anyone, what do you do in research? Cancer, cardiovascular, neuroscience. I think it's time that we shine a light in this field. But also importantly, so much of the research is so traditional, we need to activate entrepreneurs, innovators, to actually enter the field to make research in this area cool. And so consequently, we actually activated, as you know, a series of Catalyst Award funded by eight separate global agencies, including in UK, US, China, Taiwan, Singapore, Japan, and elsewhere, and covering 49 countries and territories, which we will begin by giving a series of $50,000 awards, 450 such awards, three years, and then what we like to do is to elevate it to the next level of support called Accelerator, which will provide several million dollars, particularly in trying to help commercialize, because I believe a silver economy is a good thing for all of us with good innovation, and then ultimately a grand prize. Let me spend the rest of my few minutes talking about the roadmap. So the roadmap is basically looking at, as I said, International Commission, we have, I believe, 17, 18 members from eight different countries, six different continents. Purposely to be global, but getting the best minds together. And this is co-chaired by Linda Fried from Colombia, Linda is here, and John Wong from Singapore. And we really want to look at three work streams, social, behavioral, environmental enablers, healthcare systems and public health, and science and technology. All these work streams will have cross-cutting themes to look at policy and practice, equity and disparities, uh, innovation, financing, and uh, metrics and measurements. And so you are today gathered together to look at the roadmap towards, in fact, behavioral, environmental, and social factors, which are so important. The work stream will explore and uh, recommend approaches to enhance social structures living environments and that strengthen socioeconomic and community support and enrich the individuals 
and livelihoods of the elderly population. So you will be discussing a lot on those bullets that I have on the um, slide. Now, the structure of this approach is very simple. As you heard, we have an international oversight board which oversees the conduct of this work, integrity, quality, advice, etc. And I'm very honored to have Joanne and Keizo Takemi from Japan as co-chairs of this oversight board. We have a member of really distinguished board that includes Terry Former and others on this. And then we, would have, we have the commission, which is here. This is a body which will pull together all the information from the three work streams that you can see, that one of which we're doing today. And the commission will work over 18 months to put together the report. Uh, by our estimate, we will have consulted over 200 experts through this effort. Our next workshop is going to be in Singapore on health and uh, system public health, and the one following that will be in Japan on science and innovation. The whole idea is to pull together information towards the commission who's going to prevent this report, of course, will be approved by the, the board and be widely disseminated, hopefully that we can make a difference in many parts of the world. So um, I won't t- have time to go over this except to say it's truly international. And maybe this is my last slide, which says it takes a village and collective effort to look at this issue. This slide simply shows you how many domains that we need to touch on, and we're going to try to attempt to do that so that we can see that this, in fact, is a, I guess we call collaborative, collaborative governance of trying to move this agenda forward and improve the health of everybody as they age. So thank you very much for being here. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jenny Pope, who is a commission member and also co-chair of the workshop. I should point out that the way that we structure these work streams is they formulate formulated according to workshops, which allows people to come together for two to three days to really examine this issue in great detail. And importantly, a commission member will co-chair with an expert in one of the workshops so that there's, in fact, cohesion and reporting back. So it's my great pleasure to introduce her. She's Distinguished Professor of Sociology and Public Health in Division of Health Research uh, and Director of Center for Health Inequalities and Co-Director of the Liverpool Lancaster University Collaboration in Public Health Research, which is one of the eight uh, academic members of the NIHR School of Public Health uh, Consortium. She is also Director of Engagement and Public Health Lead for the NIHR Collaboration for Applied Research, Health Research and Care for the Northwest Coast, which is a collaboration between 36 partners, including universities, local authorities, and NHS organizations. So please help me welcome Jenny. Thank you, Victor. Um, You always get very embarrassed when you hear those kinds of introductions, don't you? Um, So um, it's a real privilege to have been asked to join the commission. And uh, and the icing on the cake has actually been the co-chairing with Pauline Basinga, who will be here tomorrow from the Gates Foundation, of the planning group for, for this workshop. So I've been asked to do four things. Hopefully, I will do them in my 15 minutes. I've got a signal to cut if I go too far. So the first thing is is to say thank you to uh, various people. So first to the planning group, which I, there you go, the planning group. Um, this was a, a, an exceptional group of people, really, really amazing commitment, energy, uh, and challenge to each other, to all of us. So I think you'll see they've produced a brilliant agenda, an amazing framework for our discussions over the next few days. I'm not going to read out all these names, but thank you very much, certainly from Paulin and I and from um, the, the team at, at the National Academy for, for all the time you've put into producing the agenda. It's been great. Secondly, um, thank you to the sponsors. 
of the Roadmap Initiative and particularly, of course, for this workshop. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank AARP and Joanna and her, and her team whose hospitality we're, we're experiencing today, but all of these generous supporters. So. <laughs> Obviously, this Roadmap Initiative would not be going ahead without, without their support, so thank you very much indeed on behalf of, of the Commission. Um, and then finally, it's the, uh, the, the National Academy of Medicine staff, led by uh, Sisi Mundaka, there's Ayano, Jarrett, Stephen and Peek. You'll, if you haven't already met them and know them, you will over the next few days. A very personal thank you from me to them, um, but we wouldn't be here today if they hadn't have been uh, behind us, in front of us, leading us. So thank you to those. Say. So the, the second thing I wanted to do was just say a little about this workshop. Um, Victor's already kind of placed it within the context of the initiative as a whole. You have the program. I'm not going to go through the program in detail. What I wanted to say was just a few things. What, what we're hoping from you is to get your wisdom. Uh, Aristotle called it practical wisdom. The wisdom that you have from if you do research, from your experience, from your day job, from your lives really about a number of things. The first thing is, how best do we understand this notion of healthy longevity? What does it mean? What's the best way of framing it? And we're going to have some presentations to help us do that. But what the Commission really wanted to do, and the oversight uh, group have, have, have reinforced, is it, it isn't clearly about just older people like me and several others in the audience. It is an all-society thing. Younger people need to be thinking about this now. But it's also about equity. It's about equitable, healthy longevity. Equity within societies. I mean, my society, the UK, the USA, we have considerable inequalities in health and social experiences. So this healthy longevity vision needs to be about a healthy longevity within societies, but importantly between societies, and particularly between the global north and the Global South. So equity is a really important issue for us. So if we can get a fix on what the vision is, then what do we know about what might work in terms of this workshop, the social, environmental, and behavioral enablers, and importantly, the interactions between those enablers? These are not separate entities. They're, they're profoundly interrelated, and we need to be thinking about what do we know about what might work to maximize the potential for the future of the interactions between those. What are the challenges and gaps? What, what don't we know? Do we know what we don't know? And can we identify those? And then what should we be prioritizing in this vast agenda, really? Where should we place our bucks? Where should we really be focusing? And what, as Victor said, what are the key collaborations and how do we trigger those collaborations if they're not already triggered? So in that context, what I wanted to do was highlight three central framing devices that I want, we want, the planning committee and the commission want you to keep in mind over the next few days while we're debating and discussing. The first one is this issue of equity. Please try and keep equity in the center of your, of your frame when you're talking, when you're listening. Are we keeping it there? How do we keep it there? The second one which was really helpfully brought to the fore in the first meeting of the Commission by Linda and John, is that we want to adopt what's known as a future-back approach. Now, people in the private sector will, will probably be more familiar with this than certainly I was, because it's now part of really innovative strategic thinking, uh, it, this notion of future-back. And there's two things that, in my reading about that since the Commission, I think are really important. The first is it's about not getting trapped in the present, Right? It's about not planning where we go from where we are. So it's about a vision for maybe two decades or three de decades. Let's be clear about where we want to go and then walk back into the present and think about what are the key milestones that, was, that will help us to take that direction. So that's one key point I've read. The other is not to get trapped in a future that has multiple options, right? We do need to put a stake down to be clear about what is our vision, right? We don't need to have a detailed understanding of the route, but we need these milestones, right? We need to know what are the kinds of steps that we can take now that will get us to this future we want. So first, equity. Please keep that in mind. Second, 
future back, where are we clear about where we want to go, and then how do we get there? And then the third thing is this notion of disruptive actions. I love this idea. Joanna was talking about, let's disrupt aging. Well, I've, I've just spent a week and a bit traveling in your, in your beautiful country, particularly in the south. And I was reminded of uh, several disruptive actions or actors. I thought I would just illustrate to you, just to move us beyond the notion of disruptive products. Now, they're important, disruptive products. But I think that notion of disruptive actor or actions can be much more than that. We need to keep it more than that. So the first one, very, very, very important in the UK at the moment, is one of the most disruptive actions from a public health perspective in the UK was the creation of our National Health Service. Right? That was a policy disruptive act. Right? And it has transformed the way our health system works. It's now at risk for a number of reasons, and we need to be very cautious about that. So we can have disruptive policy action. Down in the south of your country, you cannot get away from issues like Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus uh, boycott. And what happened? That was a social movement disruption, right? So we need social movements that disrupt. We need policies that disrupt. We do need products that disrupt, and the one that I've been interested in for the last few years is the Gramsci Bank in Bangladesh and the notion of microfinancing. And that totally transformed the way in which the banking system works. So you have, that was a disruptive product, microfinancing. The key to these disrupting actions is they all had equity in the center, right? So the NHS was an equity-focused disruption. Rosa Parks and the boycott was an equity-focused disruption. And the Gramsci Bank was an equity-focused disruption. That was about tiny little loans to very poor people which transformed their lives, right? So it's not just disruptive acts again. It's this, keep, let's keep this cycle, equity, future back, and equitable disruptive action. So those are the, the three things I would really like you to keep in mind as we go through the next few days. So, just a few logistics. I always forget these. This is an open public meeting. I think this is the largest audience I've ever spoken in front of, if there really are 500 people out there somewhere listening to me. And it's quite uh, unnerving if you think about it, but it feels quite comfortable with just this number. <laughs> but it is an open meeting. We've got a live webcast. Thank you very much, whoever is out there, for listening to us. Um, and uh, we've, we've, the videos and the presentations will all be made archived on the uh, National Academy of Medicine website, um, as will the proceedings. They'll be published and a free download in the fall of 2020, I think. And just important to stress that that will not be, it will be a descriptive report. It will not be a report on any kind of consensus that comes out of this. The, the debate and discussions will go to the commission and we will debate and discuss, and they will be included in, in our report. Um, so I think that's the logistics. So to my last and probably the most important task is, is to introduce our first speaker. Um, I, I thought it might be useful just to remind the um, Americans in the audience that what you do is you say, Professor Sir Michael Marmot. It's that order. It's not Sir Professor, it's Professor Sir. It's very important. Etiquette's very important in the UK, but not to Michael, of course. No, so. So I have, it's, it's a great pleasure to introduce Michael. I, I was a, a very young, actually, uh, early career social scientist when I was first introduced to Michael's Whitehall studies. Some of you may know these Whitehall studies. I can't remember the date. I can remember the date when I was introduced to them. They were, they were the most elegant, elegant depiction of the social gradient in health. And they were called the Whitehall Studies because what he was studying was our Whitehall civil service departments, which are a reflection of our society. They're finely socially graded down the, the furniture that people have, the size of the carpet in their offices, whether they're in an office or not. So he, what he did was look at the health outcomes alongside this social gradient. So it's my introduction to health inequalities, as we refer to them in, in the UK, health inequities as they're referred to elsewhere. 
Uh, so Michael's been in my life, although he didn't know it for a long time, right? But I first worked with him when I was invited to um, coordinate a, a global knowledge network on social inclusion when Michael was leading the WHO-sponsored Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. That started in 2005, and the report... Uh, was 2008. Now, you've got his bio. I'm not going to read his bio. Partly, it may even embarrass him, but, uh, but also, it's the most extraordinary testament to a professional life that has provided extraordinary intellectual leadership, but also political leadership, advocacy, really. So, I think we're going to hear now from a living example of a disruptive actor, right? Because what Michael's done since 2008 is shift the narrative about health. So you cannot go anywhere in the world now without hearing about the social determinants of health and the social determinants of health equity. So it's a really great privilege to introduce Michael and he's going to introduce us to a framework for thinking about healthy longevity. Thank you very much, Michael. I did mean to say, actually, that amongst our friends, the thing we always say about Michael is that he's marmatized the health field. <laughs> you had before you a living example of an anticlimax <laughs> after such an introduction. I was asked to give a framework, so that's what I'll do. Uh, some would say I'm just advertising my book, I couldn't possibly comment, but the reason I'm showing this was that the first line of the book was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. Too often, not here, but too often, discussions about health equity tend to be discussions about equity in access to care. Equity in access to care is absolutely vital, as you know very well in the United States, but that's not the issue here. We're talking about the conditions in which people are born, as you said, Aging starts at birth, grow, live, work and age, the social determinants of health. When we look first at life expectancy, and we all use life expectancy not because we think it's the most important measure of health, but we can get it, uh, and I'll say something about healthy life expectancy in a moment. And things change dramatically. We've been looking at Japan for a very long time, with Roger Chung, who's over there, uh, and colleagues at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. We've been looking at now the fact that Hong Kong has longer life expectancy than Japan. Um, Cuba, slightly longer life expectancy than the US, but I've included Russia there so you can feel good about yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> And the U.S., as you know well by now, is lagging behind the other rich countries. It's not just stalled. Life expectancy declined three years in a row in the U.S. And looking at older age, life expectancy at 50 by year of birth, people who were born in 1950 will be 50 in 2000, people who were born in 1920, 50 in 1970. These are deciles of income, and it illustrates the gradient. The lower the decile of income, the shorter the life expectancy. This graph is men. And as you follow over that 30-year period, life expectancy for men in the bottom 10% of income improved just a tiny bit. And the next 10% improved a bit more, and then a bit more, and a bit more, and a bit more. So the social gradient got dramatically steeper. The inequalities got dramatically bigger. I don't want to spoil your afternoon. That's men. That's women. Life expectancy declined for the bottom 10%, the next 10%. The third decile, life expectancy for women at age 50, declined for the bottom 30% of the income distribution. 
the gradient got dramatically steeper, the inequalities got dramatically bigger. So everything we do has to look at distributions. It's no longer any good simply to look at averages. I remind us of this because, as we know, that a big part of the decline in life expectancy in the U.S. was what Anne Case and Angus Deaton have called deaths of despair. Opioid poisonings, suicide, alcohol-related deaths. And the mind is an important gateway by which social determinants affect health mental illness and well-being, and psychosocial pathways to physical illness through impact on behaviours and stress pathways. And the mental illness is important. I didn't show you on that first graph Singapore, but it looks very much like Hong Kong, a dramatic increase in life expectancy, but rising mental disorder. And similarly in Hong Kong, this was just... A neater graph that Roger Chung sent me. And you can see for each of these mental disorders between 2010 and 2016, they were increasing. And it's a similar picture in Hong Kong. We don't simply want to live longer, we want to have better quality of life. And if mental illness is increasing, that means something's going wrong. So why, while we're looking at the Asian tigers, these East Asian miracles of what they've done right in terms of longer life expectancy, we're also asking the question, what about quality of life? And that's the healthy life expectancy part of this dimension. And to show you an example, these are data from England. Each dot represents a small area classified by the index of multiple deprivation. So to the right, as you look at it, we've got the most affluent areas. To the left, the most deprived. And the top graph is life expectancy. And what it shows is that people near the top, living in nearly the most affluent areas, have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. And it goes all the way from top to bottom. If we compare the fifth centile with the 95th centile, there's a seven-year gap. There are much bigger differences for isolated areas, but on average, a seven-year gap. But the drama is in the gradient. Now, the bottom graph is disability-free life expectancy. That's not quite the same as healthy, but it's getting closer. The gradient's steeper. People at the top, are living about 12 years of their lives with disability. People at the bottom, 20 years of their lives with disability. The gap between the 5th and the 95th centile is now not 7, but 17 years. So it's an even bigger challenge. And in the UK, we want to have retirement age to be at a later age, to go from 65 to 68. Looking at that graph... Three quarters of the population do not have disability free life expectancy as long as 68. If we want people to work to 68, we've got to do something about the social gradient in disability. Otherwise, we'll simply shift people from pensions to disability benefits. And the immorality of poorer people working their whole lives and then never getting to enjoy a pension. And we see these gradients everywhere. In Porto Alegre, in, I can't say it, Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, um, classifying areas by degree of deprivation. The lower the socioeconomic level of the area, the higher the mortality from cardiovascular deaths. And the dark green represents the proportion of cardiovascular deaths attributable to having a socioeconomic level below the top. 45% of cardiovascular deaths can be attributed to living in areas having individual characteristics below the very top. Health inequalities, the social gradient in health, are 
fundamental to understanding health and disease. So to get to the framework, on the 1st of October, we published the report of the Commission of the Pan American Health Organization on Equity and Health Inequalities in the Americas. We called our report Just Societies, Health Equity and Dignified Lives. The idea that if we could create the conditions for people to lead dignified lives, health would improve and health equity would be advanced. And I quoted from Nelson Mandela, overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity. It's an act of justice. It is the protection of fundamental human rights, the right to dignity and a decent life. And I think that has to underlie everything we do here. So this is our conceptual framework. Don't panic. I will go through it in a bit more detail. But we've got three structural drivers, macroeconomic drivers. Number two, environment, including climate change and relationship to land. And number three, colonialism and structural racism. And then seven conditions of daily life, early life and education, working life, older people, so going through the life course, and then income and social protection, violence, neighbourhoods, housing, local environments, and health systems. And we are cognizant of thank you, of intersectionality. So we look not only at socioeconomic differences, but we look at gender, ethnicity. We've been com particularly concerned with indigenous peoples in the Americas and people of African descent uh, at sexual orientation, disability, migration, and health equity and dignified lives. Then we have two approaches to taking action, good governance and respect for human rights. Just to give you the framework, I'm going to talk about macroeconomic issues. A modified Preston curve for the Americas with income per capita of the country adjusting for purchasing power on the x-axis and life expectancy on the y-axis. And you can see at low levels of income a very clear relation with life expectancy. It's likely that if Haiti got richer, as rich as Bolivia, it would get better health. And if Bolivia got as rich as Brazil, its health would improve. For low-income countries, one route to getting better health is to get richer. You can do things with money that you couldn't do if you're a poor country. But when you get up to the level of Costa Rica, Cuba, and Chile, at around $17,000 at purchasing power parity, and go all the way out to the United States, there's simply no relation between national income and life expectancy. US has an income per capita about 20% larger than Canada, but life expectancy that's two to four years shorter than Canada. And as I showed you, shorter than Cuba and Costa Rica and Chile. So it's not simply a matter of getting richer as a country. It's paying attention to the social determinants of health. The first is inequities in power, money and resources. The Gini coefficient as a measure of income inequality is not a fixed given quantity for a country. A country can take steps to change it. So you've got here Argentina with comprehensive social protection systems, in-kind transfers and direct transfers, a big reduction in the Gini coefficient of income inequality. Mexico, somewhat smaller. El Salvador, much less. Government action can change the magnitude and effects of income inequalities. 
if we look at the share of total income going to the top 1% of the population, this is data from the Institute for Fiscal Studies in the UK, in 1929, in the US, the top 1% had 23% of total household income. And you remember what happened after 1929, or at least you read about it. And then it all came plummeting down. And through the 1950s, 60s and 70s, it was much lower. And then all countries seem to have got an increase. The top 1% got an increased share. In the US, it again went up to 23% in 2007, and you remember what happened next. And while there's been an increase in all these countries, in the US, it's particularly egregious. And one of the effects is that whereas it was reasonable to expect that each generation would be better off than the generation before, there's been a steady decline in the US in the percent of children earning more than their parents. So that for children born in 1984, it's about 50-50 whether you're going to be better off than your parents. That's a fracturing of the American dream. And that may indeed be having an effect on the health and well-being and healthy life expectancy. I can't resist showing you this. It came from this prestigious medical journal, the New York Times, uh, looking at the US tax rates by income. So the first, this is 1950, and by income group. And the US had a very progressive um, tax rate. Now, this is not just income. It's federal, state, local, direct and indirect taxation. This is what happened to the progressivity by 1980, 2016. And then that orange nightmare in the White House uh, boasted about the biggest um, the tax change in the country. So what happened as a result of that most recent tax change is that the top 400 earners now pay a lower rate of tax than any other income group. So you can see change in effective tax rates from 1962 to 2018. The bottom 50%, their tax rate went up from 22.5 to 24%, what's sportingly called the middle 40%. I think that's 50 to 90. It's an con interesting concept of middle, but anyway, went up. And then all the other groups, it came down. And for the richest 400, it went down to 23%, which, as I said, is lower than any other group. It does not have to be that way. And in the UK, we don't look so healthy either uh, in terms of our tax rate at 35%. <sighs> I shouldn't go into this, but I will. Uh, I've been rude about the political leader in this country. Let me be pol polite about the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, who this morning compared raising the top rate of tax on the top 5% to Stalin attacking the Kulaks. <laughs> it's disgusting. Structural drivers, the natural environment, climate change and relationship to land. In Costa Rica, nearly 100% of energy was renewable energy. We can do it. Even in the United Kingdom, there were days last year where the energy from renewable sources exceeded that from fossil fuels. It is quite possible. We've got the Paris Accord. <laughs> I'm trying to remain calm. Um, <laughs> health equity impacts of ongoing colonialism and structural racism. Examples abound. But population 12 to 17 not attending secondary school by sex 
indigenous identity and place of residence. And for all of these countries, the indigenous population were less likely to be in second, less likely to be in secondary school than the non-indigenous population. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Say if secondary school benefits everybody. We know how to do that. Why should indigenous peoples not have the same access to secondary school? Conditions of daily life, equity from the start. We know that attendance at pre-primary predicts school performance. And school performance predicts the kind of job you have, the kind of income you have, where you live, the conditions that will lead to better health. And in all of these countries, people in the lowest income quintile were less likely to attend preschool. Arguably, the people who needed it most were the ones who were getting it least. But we've got good news. In First Nation communities in Canada, where there was a specially table, a tailored Aboriginal Head Start program, that program improved motor skills, academic skills, and language skills. So you take a group that's peculiarly disadvantaged, children in First Nations families, you have an intervention, and you can change things. In Brazil, the conditional cash transfer program, Bolsa Familia, which gives money to poor women, conditional on certain things happening. We can talk about it later, Jenny. <laughs> and what it showed was in the areas where there was greater coverage from Bolsa Familia, the under five mortality went down improving the economic circumstances of poor women makes a difference to their children's health. Slightly older group, UNICEF report card 14, looking at neonatal mortality, suicide, age 0 to 19, mental health, age 11 to 15, drunkenness, age 11 to 15, and fertility, age 15 to 19. And looking at all those countries, the one that I've highlighted just because I did, was the United States, which ranks near the bottom. Starting to build up a picture of poor scores in early child development, not good mental health in adolescence, and we know what's happened to income uh, at older ages. Decent work. This is the change in informality rates, working in the informal sector, tends to be worse for health than working in the formal sector because there's no occupational health standards, no security of tenure, no fringe benefits and the like. And things got worse in Mexico, Bolivia and El Salvador, but improved in all these other countries. It is possible to make changes really quite quickly in one decade. Dignified life at older ages Percent of people over retirement age who receive a contributory social security pension in Latin America and the Caribbean. It is not the case that some countries are simply too poor to pay a pension. Many poor countries do it and older people do get a pension. It's quite possible to do that. Income and social protection. I've already shown you what's happened to tax rates in the US. This is the United Kingdom. Public spending percent change from 2010. We had this fetish in the UK. It was called austerity. Somehow that was going to improve everything. It didn't work. Look at the one at the bottom. Welfare for families. The spending on welfare for families declined by more than 40%. Social protection declined by more than 20%. Education, nearly 20% decline in education. What are they doing? Health care expenditure did go up, but as we know, inflation in the National Health Service 
rises faster than the general inflation. So the spending per person went down. We had more people and more older people. The spending per person went down. But this was a political choice. We will spend less on welfare for families. We'll spend less on education, less on social protection. And what does that mean? We tell people to eat healthily. Eat lots of fruit and vegetables. If people in the UK followed the healthy eating advice, people in the bottom 10% of household income would have to spend 74% of their household income on food. They're not failing to eat healthily because of ignorance, because of willfulness, because they're addicted to fast food. They're failing to eat healthily because they can't afford it. If they spent money on food, who's going to pay the rent? And if they spend money on rent, who's going to heat the apartment? Food is a housing issue. Housing is a poverty issue. Poverty is a food issue. Reducing violence. You're rightly concerned about homicide rates in the United States. The US looks like a haven of peace and tranquility compared with many of the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean with these very high homicide rates. But they can change. In Colombia, the homicide rates, always higher in men than women, came down dramatically. That may well have been related to attacking and smashing the cartels. That means we can't deal with something like homicide just by individual education or approaches. We've got to deal with the structural drivers. Another marker of violence is intimate partner violence against women across the lifetime. And we see these dramatic differences between countries. The evidence is something like a third of women worldwide have been subject to violence against women. Environment and housing conditions. You've been reading over the last week about what's happened in Delhi. In Delhi, the air pollution is so bad, so bad in Delhi, that they cancelled a cricket match. Oh, and people can't breathe. Um, it, it's many times higher than the safe limits. Well, throughout the Americas, we're concerned about air pollution. Health systems are important, good governance, and human rights is fundamental. Let me finish with this. Where might this phrase have come from? A well-being approach can be described as enabling people to have the capabilities they need to live lives of purpose, balance, and meaning for them. Amartya Sen? Yeah, could be. Sounds like it. But in fact, where I got this quote from was the New Zealand Ministry of Finance. This is the credo of the New Zealand government, of the Ministry of Finance. What an idea to have a government that has a well-being approach, that wants to enable people to have the capabilities they need to lead lives of purpose, balance, and meaning. And I would say lives of dignity. We have a great deal of evidence of how to achieve this. Now's the time to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Painted a, a really in-depth picture of the... Do you need that? Yes. Oh, right. Painted, painted a really in-depth picture of the current, the, the present conditions that if we don't disrupt the pathway, 
will determine equitable health, longevity, future, the future back. So, and I think that was really helpful to kind of have a sense of what this present looks like. But importantly, what you also did, which is critical for us, was show that it doesn't have to be like that. That actually there are countries, social systems that are doing better, that it's a choice. Um, but we still need to think about the kind of the things that trigger those uh, different pathways. And the framework, I think, is really, really helpful. And I think we've got an opportunity over the next two or three days to, to populate the framework from an equitable, healthy, longevity perspective in terms of the structural drivers, the conditions of, of, uh, of, of everyday life and those actions, the two actions. So thank you very much. I find it really stimulating. I'm sure the audience here and out there did, but it's time for questions and comments. So please say who you, who you are. And, um... Yes, so you need to go up to the mics on the side if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Jack Rowe, Jack Rowe, Columbia University. Thank you, Michael, uh, for, for this and for your marvelous body of work. Um, with respect to healthy longevity, would you comment on the observation I think is made at SHARE and perhaps elsewhere that while there's a, a steep gradient of uh, health status based on education or wealth at age 65, say, the rate of decline in health status thereafter seems not to be related to uh, wealth or educational level, and uh, which is an interesting observation, and uh, I just want, or a suggestion. I wonder if you have a comment on that. Well. The rate of decline, um, I've looked at particularly for cognitive function and physical function, the rate of decline is rather similar, but because the starting level is so different that in the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, for example, and the Whitehall 2 study, people of lower status reach the same low level of function about 12 to 15 years earlier than people of higher status. So they're declining at similar rates, but they start from such different points that, and the decline starts later in people of higher status, that functionally at any given older age, you see this huge social gradient. And I think it's a combination of the life course and the conditions affecting older people. I think both are important. While I've been emphasizing early childhood, I don't think it's all over by age five. I think there's a great deal we can do about the social conditions affecting older people. Uh, my name is uh, uh, George Vredenberg, uh, Us Against Alzheimer's. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna come back to the question about roadmap uh, and vision and goals in a moment. But I'd be curious as to whether you've tried to model uh, what the global uh, GDP might be uh, if, in fact, these differential conditions were equalized. That is, would the global growth double in rate if you equalized these conditions and then examined how much it would cost to get there? Because painting out this picture says, okay, we got an enormous justice uh, an economic problem. But how much would it cost to uh, correct it, and how much increase in global economic well-being might exist if we did correct it? So that you say to the world's governments, we could have average GDP per capita double if we were to correct these conditions, and it would cost us 25 percent of that growth in order to achieve it. So I'm trying to lay out an economic model that says it is of worth to the globe uh, to actually solve these problems. Yeah, I, it's a very interesting question. I can't answer it from a global perspective, uh, how to get Ethiopia growing at the same rate as Sweden. I, I can't answer that from an economic perspective. Sure, but within countries, I mean, firstly... Nobody, certainly 
not me, thinks that the best organization is to every, have everybody to have the same income and wealth. I don't think anybody thinks that's a good model, and certainly we don't have any precedent that such a model would work. So we recognize that there are always going to be important economic inequalities, and that's the way all our systems work. The question is what the magnitude is. And I don't think many economists are now in much doubt that, for example, the level of inequality in the in the US uh, is dysfunctional. It's not good for economic growth. There's quite a good body of evidence now to say that the argument about incentives is wrong, is completely wrong. It's factually incorrect. Letting rich have even more so they'll be incentivized to create is just completely wrong. Uh, it doesn't work. It's wrong. And that having a more progressive tax system and trying to deal with the pre-tax inequality is of vital importance. Not would it not cost money, it would actually save money, it would generate income and wealth by dealing with it. How one then translates that from to a global perspective is much more difficult because starting conditions are so difficult. All the things that I talk about of early child development and education and all the systems that we're blessed with in the rich countries, insurance, regulation of markets, legal systems, all those things that are absolutely vital for functioning of a market, plus a well-developed public sector, they're all vitally important and they're not well developed in many low and middle income countries. And those things would all have to change. So it's not simply some notion of equalizing income. It's much more investing in the societal structures that are nece necessary for markets to grow and function well. Hello, um, Anna Dixon um, from the Centre for Aging Better in the UK. Thank you, Michael, for your um, analysis. Um, obviously, I think we all accept there are actions to be taken at every stage of the life course. Um, there's been suggestions by um, Andrew Scott and others that with a 100-year life, we need to sort of stop just thinking about the sort of early years and education, this idea of working life and then um, sort of old age and retirement and particularly um, as you yourself uh, was alluding to the sort of uh, ability to work longer is very different uh, in terms of the inequalities um, and so some of the actions that perhaps in a sort of richer population uh, in your 60s that'll make a difference of how healthy you are at 80 in poorer communities, those are interventions that we need to be thinking about when people are like 40. So I was wondering sort of how, what actions you thought we should be taking at those sort of later stages of working life, as you called it, um, that are really going to make the biggest difference, not to longevity, but to the healthy years, the healthy longevity. Uh, in, in my own mind, there's, uh, these are important research questions of how much intervening in those middle years will lead to healthier older age as distinct from or in addition to the interventions at older ages. I know from our Whitehall 2 study of civil servants, the people who have more fulfilling working lives, have more control over their work, when they retire, tell us about an active retirement that looks pretty wonderful. You know, they get involved with their local community, they're involved with clubs and social organisations, and they have a very active retirement. The people who are lower income and have less control over the work, one woman talked to us and said, I get up as late as possible. I think I've had my last holiday. And socially isolated, nothing to do, very little money, not the skills and social 
networking, etc. So, in other words, what happens in working life may have an impact on things like atherosclerosis and the build-up of chronic disease, but it might also have a big effect on the circumstances that will affect you in later life. Having said to Jack that I don't think it's all over by five and it's not all over by 65, what happens in older life is important, but I'm sure that it's much better to start earlier in life and having a fulfilling life at working ages is going to be a good predictor of what happens at older ages. <laughs> sorry huh, I'm not used to my own voice so sorry um, can, can I just say when I um, smiled at Jenny and said we can talk about <laughs> it later um, it goes back to when Jenny was um, convening the knowledge network on social inclusion and she raised the question about why should conditional cash transfer schemes have conditionalities built in. And my response was, well, I'm sure you're right, but we've got good evidence that they work. And given how little good evidence we've got for things that do work, don't throw this one out. Um, but I've been thinking about her question ever since. She raised that question a dozen years ago. And I think there is evidence. So I quoted a conditional cash transfer scheme from Brazil. But I think there is also evidence that such schemes without the conditionalities can have beneficial effects. Yes. So I'll, I'll end with a, um, a comment from the Mexican uh, treasurer, right? Uh, the, um, and we were having exactly this debate on Women's Hour, Woman's Hour. And what he said was the reason they'd introduced conditionality into the, the equivalent program in Mexico was not about getting the poor to comply with the conditions. It was about getting the rest of the population to agree to the program. So, and it, what it relates to is the issue of ageism and stigma against old people, but also stigma against the poor, really. So I think it, it isn't uh, how you get the population to buy in to some of the things that are implicit in the picture that Michael has been painting for us here about the current conditions is a really key issue for, for the Commission. So, Michael, thank you very much indeed. A great foundation for us. So, I, my final task that I can go and sit and, and, and listen to all these fascinating presentations is to introduce Emily. Emily Grundy is Pro Professor of Population Science um, at the University of Essex, who's going to moderate our, our next session. So, Emily, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Jenny. And it's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm, I've Already we've had a fantastic start, and I'm really looking forward to the whole of the rest of the programme. Um, there are five speakers we've got in our next session, so I'm not going to... Uh, take a lot of time, especially as some of them have already confessed that they've got too many slides. So uh, we have to move on. But I just wanted to uh, remind everybody here and also the, the people who are participating remotely that we, we have collective tasks in this session in that we, we need to come up a bit more with what we mean by healthy longevity, how we measure it, and uh, more of an understanding of the uh, contributions of social, behavioral, and environmental enablers. So uh, hopefully when we, we have the discussion, um, we can build on what we're going to, what we've already heard and what we are going to hear and, and try and um, move ourselves forward a bit. So we've got a, a wonderful lineup of uh, um, speakers. And our, our first speaker is Lisa Berkman. Where is she? Oh, hi, Lisa. Come on. Who's a director of the Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies. And I'm sure, ver well, everyone here is, I'm sure, familiar with uh, Lisa's work in huge range of areas, really hugely relevant for this. And so she's going to be talking about what is healthy longevity 
understanding the multifaceted challenges and opportunities and from a life course perspective, which we know is essential. So thank you, Lisa. Well, thanks, Emily, and it's a pleasure to be here um, participating in this agenda has been really, truly exciting. Um, I am one of the people who has too many slides in part, not quite understanding the length um, constraints that we had. So I'm going to go through some of them um, quickly. And in fact, Victor's out uh, presented some of the early ones. So my goals today are for you to understand a little bit more about what healthy um, life expectancy is and what aging societies mean to understanding healthy life expectancy, and then to talk a little bit about what are some of the social determinants of health, mostly in midlife, that can affect um, aging and healthy life expectancy as we go forward, and finally, what are some of the policy solutions and ways that we might go forward. So I wanted to show this slide. Um, let me see if I can get it to move. Um, here, which is very similar to what, um, it's not moving. I think if somebody back there can just push, uh, oh, it is moving, there it goes. <laughs> Whoops. Maybe we'll skip through these. <laughs> these, are, these are moving slides of, of the demographic change that you see, and it illustrates very clearly the kind of movement that we have from a pyramid to what is really a column in terms of aging and it's for several countries. What I wanted to point out, particularly because this agenda is a global one, is that by the time we look at 2040, um, and we look at the ratio of older people and younger people, not only do we have this lack of a pyramid, but if you look at the darker colors and the lighter colors, the darker colors are the developed countries of the world. The lighter colors are developing, emerging countries. So. By and large, the future of the country, of the universe and the globe, and in fact, our world as we know it, is going to sit in developing countries and emerging countries today. Um, developing countries are going to play a very small part, and even though that's a complete pyramid, you see the very large contribution that other countries are going to play. So it becomes central in all our thinking to have this kind of image embedded. Um, the other one that Victor showed is just the proportion of um, people under five to people over 65. And again, you see this crossing um, just about now. And I want everybody to note that all the people under five um, have been born already <laughs> when we think about, and 65-year-olds have been born um, by the time we look at 2050. So if we look at everybody over 65 in 2050, they were about born in 1985. So if we're thinking about early childhood um, experiences, I agree with Michael, very, very important. But in large part, the show's over um, for those people. They're already you know, 15, 18, 20. So we had better have a better solution if we're thinking about what to do by 2030, 2040, 2050. And I'll skip over these fertility um, slides. And I want to show here that the speed at which countries achieve population aging varies enormously. So some countries have had a long time to think about this. France has had a really long time. Sweden has had a long time. The UK has had a long time. These are the Asian tiger countries, Korea, China, Thailand, Brazil. They have had a really short time to come to grips with what this situation looks like. So when we think about aging societies, we have to understand that the pace at which societies age has a lot to do with their ability to respond in any way effectively. So when you think about retirement, pension systems, redoing working age, a lot of this has to do with the speed at which we age. So what is healthy life expectancy? This commission has talked a lot about this. Um, it certainly is mortality, but mortality plus morbidity plus what else? I think it's in the eye of the beholder. We haven't um, 
come to any real consensus, I don't think, about this. But I wanted to show you one about mortality because one of the things um, often we talk about with life expectancy is whether we're talking about healthy life expectancy or health span or lifespan. So these are life table deaths by age and year, and the darker they are, the more they are different cohorts of people. And you can see what's happened is that life... Um, Mortality rates have improved and improved for people in their 70, 75, 80, 85, 90. By the time you get to 100, we've not budged very much. So there are going to be more 100-year-old people. We all know that that's true. But increasing lifespan, the idea that we go much beyond 100, is something that hasn't happened very much. And in terms of an equity lens, we, were mu we would be much better off trying to get everybody to 85 or 90 rather than spending a lot of energy on getting people from 100 to 110 in terms of the evidence. I wanted to show two, two variables related to what we might think about as healthy life expectancy in terms of blood pressure and cholesterol. Disability is surely the other one. But I want to show this one because it brings up the issue of how much we want to count um, medicine as truly improving the situation. So here um, what we have is measured um, high blood pressure, for instance, um, on the top here. Um, and medication and measured high blood pressure. So if we look at measured high blood pressure, which is the dark black line and cholesterol, you see that there have been improvements over time. These things have dropped in large part. Oh, in large part, they've dropped um, because people are on antihypertensive and cholesterol-lowering drugs. So in a sense, that works. But if you look at actually the amount of hypertension or cholesterol, high cholesterol there is in the population that's not medicated, that's due to that. It hasn't changed at all. So we're making it go down because of medication, but we're not actually preventatively lowering blood pressure or cholesterol. So I think there's a big debate about how much we want to depend on these things. So now I'm going to move into the social determinants of health. And really, I want to build on this idea that exposure, exposures in early and midlife will really determine patterns of healthy life expectancy and healthy aging. And there's a lot to be said about early childhood, but actually I think there's a lot to be said about midlife. Um, these are the numbers for the United States. As I think everybody has now shown, we're at the bottom for just life expectancy. This is it for women. And if you look at um, overall the race and ethnicity adjusted life expectancy by income, these are data from Raj Chetty, you see that overall these are for men and women, that um, there's a steep gradient, and the gender difference actually gets smaller as income gets higher. But there's a gradient all the way along in terms of life expectancy. And as others have suggested, inequalities are widening over time. There's been almost stagnation at the bottom and improvement at the top. These are data um, from Gary Bertless and uh, folks at Brookings who did um, estimates for Social Security. And what you can see is that these are looking at two co cohorts of people. On the top are people in blue, dark blue, who were born in 1940, and people on the light blue who were born in 1920. And over time, there have been enormous improvements of people in the top decile um, for education. And this is income distribution, so 8.7 years difference in the two cohorts, um, looking at life expectancy at age 50 for men, and 1.7 for women. However, if I want you to hold on to that 1.7, if you look at what it is for women, it's completely no improvement in life expectancy for not only the bottom decile, but I think it quite congruent with Michael's data, also the second decile and the third decile, and it takes fully 40% of women at the bottom to get to the same improvement that men had during this same period. So steep gradients but quite gender-related. And while all countries have inequality, some countries have greater inequality than others. Um, this is the difference in the United States, which is the first country and the highest bar. And you'll also notice that for um, 
the best off, um, high, highly educated people, we still have the highest mortality rates. So we aren't lowest even among the best of us. And while some countries like France still have inequalities, their difference is 252 deaths, whereas ours is 686. Huge differences in the range of inequalities. So I want to talk about another variable, um, social integration, um, which goes as far back as Durkheim to think about what's important about social integration and isolation and exclusion is that it relates to two things, attachment and regulation. And here's early data from Alameda County showing the relationship between social integration and all-cause mortality with people in the green bar having the most isolated experiences um, really at great increased risk. And this is net of socioeconomic conditions. Um, this has been um, replicated in France and now in hundreds and hundreds of countries with the same kind of um, findings and across many causes of diseases, which makes one think about whether there are shared pathways and it makes the issues of what are the biological pathways that push on so many diseases really important for us to be exploring. And these just show, for the rest of the world, the relationship between social support, volunteering, and self-rated health around the world. These are for high-income countries. They're the relative risks. They're all in the positive direction, East Asia and Pacific. So countries like Japan, China, Cambodia, Malaysia, Thailand, um, South Asia and Oceania, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So virtually around the world, we see the effects of social isolation. And Importantly, social isolation and social integration predict the preservation of memory and many cognitive skills. So these are data from the Health and Retirement um, Study, which show longitudinal relationships between social integration and cognitive performance. So what are the policies that might promote in midlife um, working longer, and I call this the longish arm of uh, early and midlife experiences because there's a great article on the long arm of early childhood, and uh, I would just say this is longish. Um, so things like family leave, sickness absence, schedule control, um, the earned income tax credit, unemployment, um, training, attention a lot at the lower and middle wage earners, and what are the long-run benefits, and how often these kinds of policies are never evaluated in cost-benefit um, equations. So I want to show you one slide related to cognition and time away from work in adult life. Um, and this shows that there are we're, they're looking at five areas of p reasons why people take time away. Unemployment, sickness, um, home ma being a homemaker for a while, training and maternity. And you'll notice in the red bar that training and maternity actually lead to positive um, cognitive performance, whereas the other ones lead to decrements in performance. And each of these models increasingly controls for more socioeconomic conditions. So by the time you get to the end, you see that the risks for unemployment, sickness, and just staying out of the labor force are above one, whereas taking time off for training and maternity leave are protective. And to talk about the social protection policies, for a little bit more. Um, many of you may have to stand up in the back of the room to see where the United States sits here. Um, but in fact, the United States, of course, is at the very bottom of any kind of social protection for um, family leave, whereas other countries have many, um, many sources of support for this. And in an article that we did on the effects of maternity leave that we did from SHARE, I will just go through these really quickly, where we looked at paid family leave. What is the effect of living in a country with paid family leave on your depression when you're out of the workforce at 65? So 30 years later, what is the effect of living in a country with paid family leave? And these policy data come from OECD. And basically, what we show is that there's a 16% difference in depression scores between living in a low or a high maternity leave country with respect to paid leave. So something about leave in midlife has an enduring impact 
on depression at later life. And this isn't your own leave, whether you took it or not. It's a policy. So it's exogenous to you. So depression in old age is linked to maternity leave policies during the critical period of the birth of a first child. And now I want to go in a little bit more detail, and I'm about one minute out, of structural racism just to show the other effect of things that happen to people who are adults. Um, there are a lot of examples we could take, but we'll take incarceration. So this is data on mass incarceration um, and widening inequality in the United States. These are a whole lot of countries and their incarceration rates. They're mostly flat little things on the bottom. And if you'll look at this one, that's the United States, complete outlier in terms of incarceration. If we thought incarceration influenced both family stability, ability to be in the workforce, and to have a health outcome, we might do well to think about the rates of incarceration that we have. And it means that between, if you look at a cohort of men born in 1945, um, and their um, experience of imprisonment, it was about you know, less than 10%, very different for blacks and whites. But if you look at the cohort between, that was born in 1965, you can see that the incarceration rates have gone up enormously, especially for high school dropouts. So if we want to think about something that ruins somebody's career and family life and maybe health for their entire life, in midlife, we would do well to think about incarceration. And these are just the statistics showing what the effects are on spillovers to people who are family members and to other um, neighbors and that sort of thing. So overall, in terms of a possibility for thinking about a solution, I want to say there are many, many solutions. Obviously, changing policy is another one. But one approach that has been talked about for environmental um, impacts and climate change is to think about the environment, environmental impact assessment model and how this could be done to think about the effect to which it extends healthy life expectancy um, and aging population productivity. And just to end, I want to say that demography is a powerful experience, but it really is not destiny. It's completely our response to it that will determine our societal resilience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. And we're going to have uh, the questions for these first three sessions all in a group at the end. So we'll, we'll have a chance to respond to some of those really interesting things that Lisa's told us about. So our, our next speaker is uh, Ali Mokdad, who's a professor of health metrics, which is clearly very relevant for this uh, the discussion we, we should be focusing on, and the Chief Strategy Officer for Population Health and Director of the uh, Middle Eastern Initiative at the University of Washington. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the, a lot of slides and why. So let me read you to you what they asked me to do. And uh, I know something about numbers and metrics, so there are eight questions. Uh, what are the drivers and best predictor of uh, longer uh, health span in aging population? How do they differ within across countries? How might trend evolve in the next 10, 15? I'm cutting because it counts against my time. What are the barriers for effective uh, use of data? What are the options of measuring health CO? It's another question. And how can data collection and analysis technique be improved? Then more questions. What is the ideal modeling platform to assess policy options, and how can we best use this data to disrupt the status quo? So eight questions in 12 minutes. So let's be sure when she tells you we have more slides than we did, uh, you understand where I'm coming from. <laughs> uh, so I want to answer these questions, but uh, I want to answer it indirectly, and then uh, go back at the end of the talk and summarize what I meant. So I want to talk about uh, what we do at IHME, uh, Institute for Health Metric and Evaluation, talk about our global burden of disease, which is a way of assessing health loss, and focus about the U.S. Many of you talked about the U.S. Uh, uh, Dr. Um, Professor Sir Michael also talked a lot about the U.S. There are other projects that we do at IHME that I'm not showing you, but they're relevant, and I made all these slides available so they can share. I want to talk about health disparities in the U.S. and what's driving it, which is for aging as well, and summary and next steps. 
So what we do at the IHME, we do what the health problem of a population or a city, whatever that population is, or a country or subnational, what is the society doing to addressing those? And the third one, which is the most important, how could we maximize our input giving our output? I mean, our output giving our input. Uh, and we are about 550 full professors uh, with three, 35 faculty. Bunch of statistician, uh, modelers, uh, you name it. But we have 4,300 collaborators all over the world working with us on these projects. So it's very important that we're getting feedback from everybody else. So, and I think that's not the right presentation, but that's okay. I hate guns, but before uh, global burden of disease, if you ask somebody who's working on TB, will tell you so many people are dying from TB, you add all the different group what they're telling you, you have more mortality than we have in reality. So GBD is the first systematic scientific way of measuring health loss for every country in the world. About 360 diseases and their sequelae, diabetes, amputation, 84 risk factors from 1990 till right now, and we do it on a yearly basis trend by age group, by sex. Five years age group, we do it continuous, but we present this data. So in addition to the traditional metrics that people provide, and today there was a lot of talk about it, one is years of life loss. So we take the highest life expectancy in the world, a Japanese woman, uh, and then we say if somebody here dies at 60, they lost 26 years of life because they could have lived 26.9 as much as a Japanese woman. We could attribute this loss to a cause or a risk factor. And the second one is here lived with disability. So somebody here at a 60 in Washington, D.C., getting diabetes for 10 years until death or a disease and until remission, we count the disability based on the severity of that disease. So the first one tells you what people are dying from and how early. The second one is telling you what's ailing people. So back pain, neck pain, mental health, which creates a lot of disability. So DALIS is the combination of the two. So you'll hear me talking about DALIS and HALE is healthy life expectancy. Uh, a lot of complexity in GBD that I'm not going to go in detail. We, everything I'm presenting today is available on our web. Even the programs that produce the numbers that I'm sharing with you, the codes are available on our web through GBD Compare. Uh, one of our innovation, we use medical record and we have 7 billion medical record right now. Again, not the slides that I wanted to show. So, the in the United States, if you look at this, very hard to see. We could tell what's the causes of this, age standardized, what's increasing, adjusting for the age structure of the population in the United States. And you could see here diabetes, for example. Uh, blue is chronic diseases, uh, red is infectious diseases, and green are injuries. And you could see chronic disease burden in the United States. And when you look, flip it at the other end, is what's really causing this disability in the United States are risk factors. And many of them here, tobacco, high blood pressure, diet, alcohol, are contributing more than 8 9% of the total DALIs, out of the 100% DALIs. So these are the main risk factors that are contributing to that. So if you come to the United States and break it, we talked about life expectancy in the US, ages 0 to 20, probability of deaths, the national number, and by state, and these were published in JAMA, so what it used to be, the shaded, and now where it is, the line, straight line, the black, you could see for every state here, the probability of deaths decrease for 0 to 20. The probability of deaths for 20 to 55, that's a totally different story. For 21 states, it went back. From 1990 to 2017, the probability of deaths increased, did not increase. And for many of the states, about 15 remained stagnant. If you look at ages 55 to 90, improvement in every state. There is a huge disparities of the variation, but our main problem in the United States when we talk about life expectancy and we're falling behind everybody else is 20 to 55. And as you could see here from the color code available on our web, it's mainly drug diabetes, obesity, some of the risk factors, but drug abuse and, this, uh, and alcohol, of course, in the US. And then you look at these risk factors for rank them for every state, they're the same one. Five to six are the top one, everyone. The variation was in the state. California, for example, does better on smoking because they invested in smoking prevention. So let me talk, uh, we, we have the sustainable development goal at GBD, uh, at IHME, 
Uh, we provide it for every country in the world. We, you can see a lot of variation even within a country. I'm not going into the detail. We do health access and quality index for every country in the world. The United States also ranks poorly on every one of them. Uh, we rank like number 21, uh, 29. Iceland is uh, number one at, uh, and has a score of 97. Again, huge variation even in the United Kingdom, uh, all the countries that we do subnational, even for us in the United States. We do human capital index. Somebody mentioned education here and development, economical development. We look at the human capital index, ages 20 to 60, health probability of death in this age group, education, attainment. Not only at IHME, we don't only use years of education. We use quality of education, learning, based on international tests. We rank countries. And human capital index, investing in this age group, of course, is strongly associated with economical development. Uh, and then again, the U.S. fares uh, much worse than us. We trace all the money, who spends money, where it goes. And then in the United States, we can tell you where the increase in spending is going on, mainly in the U.S. cost of drugs. There is a shift of utilization between inpatient and outpatient. And... Uh, Lisa before me said the risk uh, factors for uh, went down for blood pressure and cholesterol. You could see the decline in uh, prevalence of certain risk factor had reduced our cost in the U.S. And then we spent 3.5 trillion on health compared to the world spending 8 trillion. And the debate shouldn't be that we spend more money. We should, if we have more money, we should spend more money on something. But are we getting the return on investment that we really deserve? No, we're not. And we do something called local burden of disease. We do future health scenarios for every country in the world where we take a risk factor. I'm showing the United States risk factor where I show you the blue line is what's the projected up to 2040 for obesity in the United States, high body mass index. And then red is an alternative if the states perform at, the eight, at 15 and 85. So rank everybody in their performance and don't take the outliers. Take 85 being the best, 15 the worst, not the outliers. We could go even worse in the red if we perform at 85. We could improve our performance at perform at the green level. Blood pressure, the same way. We're seeing a decline in the U.S. We could do better and we could reverse. So basically what I'm showing you here, there is nothing that we are doing in health and everywhere in the world that we can take for granted. Smoking again in the U.S., success story varies by state, as I mentioned, but it could be reversed back and forth. Here is the one that's the most scary for somebody who works in the United States. We're projecting our life expectancy to go down, even our ranking to go down. For the last three years, has been actually going backward, but we're falling behind and we still will be falling behind everybody else in, in the world. And we can attribute why these changes. When you look at healthy life expectancy, West Virginia, all the way South America, except for Haiti, West Virginia has the worst life expectancy, I mean, healthy life expectancy, and spending 3.5 trillion on health here. If you look at life expectancy in the US, and I'm showing you 214, because the last year we had counties was 214, 16 is available right now. If you look in our state, 81 to 75. So the huge variation by state. If you look at counties, 67 to 87. So we have a county, Summit County in Colorado. They live more than a Japanese woman. But we have county 67, much worse than my accent in Lebanon, much worse than Syria with the civil war going in Syria. So we have the whole world here. And then these disparities are widening, and we publish those in JAMA. These disparities between the 1% to 99 are increasing. They're not decreasing in the United States. We did it at the census track in King County. Seattle is a very rich Microsoft, Boeing, our contribution to all your coffee, Starbucks, everybody. With all the wells, we also have the whole world in us. We have 68 to 89. So we have, we're talking about five, six miles from each other. And then we publish at the county level. I want to give you a flavor of the disparities here. Lung cancer, and you could see changes from 1980 to 2014. You could see some states are going backward, increasing probability of deaths here, and then where some states are improving. Flashing this, that's matching smoking. Testicular cancer, which is a disease nobody should die from, but it's very rare in the U.S., few deaths, but still a huge variation in the U.S. Breast cancer, a combination of mammograms and you know, prevention and risk factors. You could see huge variation even in the changes, self-harm in the U.S., which is big. And then 
uh, drug use, everybody saw an increase. You know, all counties agreed to increase the drug use disorder, unfortunately, in the United States. Binge drinking, different than the Southeast, you could see huge variation. So why? Why these inequalities? Socioeconomic, we talked about it, talked about education, lack of access to health care, I'm not going to talk about it. Poor quality of care is very important. In the U.S., we spend a lot of time, and I'm running out of time, talking about uh, medical errors. Uh, what I mean by uh, poor quality of care is once you are in the medical care system, how well has your blood pressure been followed up? How well are you being controlled? And the second one, which we don't do a good job at all in the United States, and many countries do, is how long does it take you, Ali Mokdad, from a chest pain to showing to a medical doctor? There is a difference in timing, and that's a big indication of survival. And then, of course, socioeconomic, I mean, preventable risk factor. Briefly, I'm ending up here. When we looked at these contributions, said, let's level the playing field in the U.S., and I'm looking at life expectancy, and here where I'm disrupting, and I'm, I'm saying stuff that are, many people are going to be upset with what I'm saying. But if you look at socioeconomic factors, and we looked at them in the United States, and behavioral and metabolic risk factor, only five, obesity, physical inactivity, smoking, hypertension, and diabetes, and we looked at quality of medical care. And we said, let's level the playing field for every county in the U.S. How much of these, dis these disparities will disappear? 60% if we address the SES. 74 if we address these five risk factors, 27 if we do it by medical care, 74 if we do all of them. So the message here, all of these are manifested, all of these are manifested through our risk factors. So regardless of what we look at the U.S., we're failing, and then many of our women are falling behind. My advice and recommendation for you is to invest in risk factors still invest in socioeconomic. I'm not so, I mean, it's, uh, I'm very supportive of that, of course. Nobody could be in public health and acknowledge the social determinant of health. But our best investment for return on investment is addressing risk factors. Because if we do so, the poor people will benefit more than the rich people. And if you are healthy and poor, you're more likely to get out of poverty than if you're not. And that's my point, very important. What should we do on the long term? We have a new contract from... Uh, and IH, and then we are looking right now at burden of disease at the county level, we have state level, at the county level by SES and by race ethnicity. And we're looking at this interaction. Is it race or income or education or combination of them? I'm done here. My last slide is what we want to do from IHME is this one. At IHME, and many of you are aware of IHME, some of you are on our board or rotated from our board, what we want to do is we want to look here at what are the trend, the first bucket, and tell you as a policymaker what's your biggest burden in 2040 or within five or ten years. Then the last one bucket here is to tell you if you invest on this, what is the return on investment from decrease of dallies and future spending. The middle bucket which is the one that we haven't done and piloted at HME except for diarrhea from a grant from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where we're looking at every possible intervention and scoring it, giving a score, p-value less than 0 0.001 to p-value 0 0.5, 50-50. And then we're reviewing all of this, including trade, what the government support, and all of the stuff in order for to provide the user with a visualization that no politician right now can spend money unless it's a top burden on his or her country. And even if they pick number three, we're going to corner them by telling them what's available. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ali. That's great. So uh, now we've got the, the third session before the break, and we are running a bit late, but uh, hopefully we can make some of it up uh, um, later in the afternoon. Uh, Askar Zaidi, where is oh, uh, who, who is uh, he's billed here as professor of gerontology at Seoul National University, but in fact he's got many other affiliations, <laughs> and uh, is also well known for his work on health me measuring aging well and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. It's five o'clock in the morning for me. <laughs> I just travelled yesterday, but. I'm so glad to be here, to have this opportunity to present to you some work that I've been doing over the last five, six years. Thank you, Jack, for your inspiring initial work on, on successful aging and all that, which led to this work, 
which I did um, mainly starting with the European countries in constructing what, I, what we call active aging index. And you would soon see that it's not a concept widely different from what uh, um, Lisa and, and Michael were talking about as, as healthy longevity. Uh, so we, we talk about the same individuals, same challenges, but we use different terminology in many ways. So my task here is to use my work and present that as a global evidence on what we can learn about healthy longevity um, and, and especially given the task given to me, what can we learn about enablers for healthy longevity? Hold on to your seats now. What is the Active Aging Index? Why is it relevant for this workshop? I would first very quickly give you what I'm tasked to do so that I could justify that using Active Aging Index is, is the right thing to do. But that's the only thing I could have talked. Um, what, what is the Active Aging Index? Many of you may not know about it. And, and the big question then is, is it really a relevant global metrics that can be used to understand what are the enablers for healthier and engaged lives, which, in my view, is what you call healthy longevity. And then, in the next, in the five minutes that I would be left with, I will present the evidence that I have generated for 33 countries of Global South, Global North, uh, ranging from Western European to Eastern European, Southern European to ASEAN to China, Japan and Korea, all that in five minutes. Um, but main thing that I want to point to at the end, what can we draw? What insights can we draw from that evidence? And I hope I will get the chance to, to contribute to that report at some stage where I could provide much more than what I can provide in 10 minutes here. So what is the, how is the Active Aging Index evidence relevant? What I was asked to do is to, under, to provide a better understanding of social, behavioral, and environmental enablers across diverse population, lifestyles, and contexts. And that's where my contribution will come, that I would be presenting a common metric that is for very different, very diverse contexts and, and, and uh, lifestyles. I will be focusing on existing evidence. That's also one aspect that I was asked to do. I would be pointing to successes of policies. When I say some countries fare better than others, I would be pointing to certain policy successes. And again, going back to that future back approach that Jenny was pointing to, uh, these are the po sort of policies on which we want to build on, basically learning from the past to go to some ideal scenario we want to achieve in the future. But most importantly, we want to identify opportunities. What can countries learn from each other? What, how could we sort of intra-country differences and inter-country differences can point to uh, opportunities to learn, mutual learning that we can draw? And here I would be, that's my um, mantra, in every presentation I make, we need more data, we need better data. So what is Active Aging Index? This picture will tell you everything you need to know about Active Aging Index. If you look at, there are 22 different indicators, and they are pointing to some economic enablers, which would be employment, which would be uh, engagement in the labor market, so let's call them economic um, enablers. Then we go to social participation, which includes volunteers, care provision at home to children, care provision at home to older adults, and, and civic and religious activities, which is again, if we are talking about healthy longevity, which is about healthier and, and engaged lives, then this is telling us that these are different ways of individuals in their older age getting engaged with the society, with the community around them. And then comes this behavioral aspect, which is about independent living. Active aging should not just be about activity per se, but if you are able, through your behaviors, to be self-reliant and independent, that's another finer form of active aging. Uh, so this third domain 
has seven indicators, which is about what behaviors lead to your independence. And then comes the fourth, which I thought at the time we were doing this five years ago, we started on it, was very novel, uh, which Riley and Riley was also in, in the literature forcefully advocating that something that missed out from successful aging literature was this enabling environment aspect, which has individual um, behaviors, uh, so healthy life expectancy pointing to people living uh, a longer life course of um, good lifestyles, um, mental well-being, because very often in healthy life expectancy, we are only focusing on physical health aspects. We are looking at subjective well-being. We are also looking at social connectedness, another enabler. If you live in an environment where you have friends and family to fall back on, um, you live in a more enabling society. We are looking at physical safety, use of ICT, and, and education as a personal enabler in that sense. When I was reading the concept note of healthy longevity, I was surprised how many of these indicators I could link to your discussion on, on healthy longevity. So it's a new active aging index framework because I have revised it now for inclusion of Japan, Korea, and China, but also Indonesia and Thailand. And I did this work initially for UNECE, European Commission. Now I'm doing this work for UNESCAP. UNFPA is also jumping in to fund for work in Azerbaijan. So I'm basically collecting all these broad breadcrumbs. Whoever pays me little money, I go and extend it for a country. Uh, and UNFPA is chipping in for uh, Azerbaijan. So what insights? And we have got four and a half minutes. These are 33 countries, including uh, EU28, as well as Japan, Korea, and China, and two countries whose report just finished. So this is the first time I'm presenting the results of those two countries, Indonesia and Thailand. It's not surprising if you look at the overall index, an index is a composite measure which summarizes the information that you have across different indicators. Uh, Sweden, Japan, and other Scandinavian countries are ranked right at the top, not very surprising. And focus for me would be to look at how, how Global South differ from Global North. And I'm looking at Thailand and South Korea. They are also sort of in the middle of the ranking alongside one of the major countries in Europe, Germany. China and Indonesia are not doing as well as Korea and Thailand. Um, but the main thing for Indonesia, and th uh, for Indonesia and Thailand is that the index value is around two-third. So it's, it's basically saying that they are as good as, they are only two-third as good as the best performing country. So that's, one could say there is still a scope for improvement. Sweden is the top-ranked country, and we see to, Sweden performs... 83.6%, which is not far from 100. Basically, if Sweden would have got the maximum indicator, maximum value in each of the indicators, it would have scored 100. And every other country's index value will be compared to the best performing indicator. So in that way, when we look at, when we say a country has an index value of 66%, we say they are two thirds the way to the best performing country. Gender differentials came out really uh, strongly. My goodness, we don't have the picture. Um, what surprised me, and there is the discussion earlier on, is to look at equity, bring equity consideration. This is a, these, these are intra-country inequities. That for me, what was very surprising is that for, almost without exception, active aging for men was higher than active aging for uh, women. Uh, especially in southern European countries, but particularly in East, East Asian countries. So it's still not quite the gender equality that we expect. So this is dis within the same context, within the same institutional context, women faring worse than men. And we found even surprisingly high gender differentials even in Netherlands and Luxembourg. So these are the countries which have observed the highest gender equality uh, in, in Europe, yet we see 
older women belonging to an older cohort still falling behind, in particular with respect to employment and income. And if you were to go through and look at each of these different sort of enablers, if you look at employment, we see Indonesia, Thailand rank remarkably uh, at the top. So when it comes to economic indicators, economic enablers, these countries, despite less resource countries compared to other European countries, they are really at the top. And the same can be said for Japan and Korea. To, to much extent for Korea, where I'm studying this in more, uh, in, in, in more depth, it's all because to do, to do with the low pension income. So people have no choice but to work. Uh, but I still like to argue that employment in later life is, is, a, good indi is a positive indicator. Employment rate of the oldest old, 65 plus, is amongst the highest in Asian countries. And again, that's different from what we observe in Global North. Um, and it's largely to do with the low pension income. But we know the positive impacts of economic engagement of older persons. So in a way, this is a positive indicator because it br brings positive um, um, outcomes. Again, women continue to fall short. So all this big debate of falling dis fertility in, in Eastern, Euro Eastern Asian countries and all that, I say this, that's a big hoo-ha. Uh, a lot more can be achieved by actually targeting uh, those uh, underemployed groups of population, such as older, older women workers in this case. I don't have time to go through all this, but the only thing I want to point out that on the one hand, East Asian countries are doing remarkably well in employment, uh, but when you go from employment away to other finer forms of active aging, you see their positions start declining. Korea, already in the second domain of social participation, is amongst the lowest performing countries. If you go further into the third, the dimension of independent living, you see that Indonesia, which was amongst the top performing countries in the first domain and second domain, becomes actually uh, in the second part of the group of countries. Enabling environment, which comes much closer to the, your discussions of enablers, uh, shows that countries are all over the place. So even, uh, but what I didn't have time to include it here that and this discussion Michael was pointing to that everything we study should have distribution in it and I wanted to just compare Gini inequality to enabling environment index and I found a very strong 0.9 uh, kind of correlation coefficient which is basically saying if income inequality is pervasive then other aspects sort of follow up other social aspects social outcomes follow up uh, that which, which is in line with what Michael was promoting. So what do we conclude from all of this? And I hope I will have time to contribute much substantive piece um, at some point. And, and this is a generic uh, conclusion you could have drawn even without this presentation. Norms and context matter strongly in the enabling factors discussion of healthy longevity. Um, and the first goal any country should have in this is to have improvements in reducing intra-country gender differences, which is in line with what Michael was saying. E equity is important. Um, and here we are pointing to that first goal a country should have is to look at gender e inequality and try to reduce that uh, because there is no reason, absolutely no reason for differences between men and women uh, with respect to active aging. Second goal, and this is basically from such a multi-country global evidence, we should start learning and drawing conclusions of what policies work, what is a good policy, and how, what factors make that policy work. And, and that, in that respect, the AAI, the Active Aging Index Type Monitoring Metrics, actually provide lots of insights. And future back thinking, I was told that I should be providing some analysis of that, is uh, basically saying that we need better data and we need better monitoring instruments like the Active Aging Index. 
And in this respect, let me just point out, the work is already underway of Titchfield City Group on Aging, which is basically doing a global stock taking of what data exists on aging related um, 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 issues and how we can go about making recommendations global worldwide to improve data on, uh, on aging related statistics. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. So now we have an opportunity for questions to any of the speakers or contributions to the theme of this session or other points. And uh, perhaps if you people making contributions need to go to a microphone and uh, identify themselves. Well, well, I think I'll maybe start by asking a kind of measurement issue. So, Lisa, you you um, you took healthy longevity to be the same as healthy life expectancy. So, I don't know whether everybody agrees with that, or whether we think of longevity as being life expectancy after a certain age, or or, or whether there's there's some kind of um, difference in that, um, and but I think you raised some questions which I thought were uh, important in the whole discussion. One is about the um, spillover from one group to another. So, the health and circumstances of older people are important not just for them, but but for their younger family members, the societies that they live in. And, and this comes across, too, in these, these sort of index um, that ASCA's using, which is based on kind of um, macro community things. But perhaps needs, we also need to think of the cohort thing. I mean, Lisa, again, you made the point that um, if we're talking about the next 20, 30 years, we're talking about people who've already lived quite a large part of their life. Uh, and so their employment trajectories, for example, will be influenced by uh, their cohort experience, which may be relevant, say, women in the Netherlands actually used not to work very much, I believe so. And then the um, global burden of disease, which we, we've seen they've got assembled a, a huge amount of um, data and measures and, and everything... So here we got the message that what we should be focusing on is behaviours and, and these um, risk factors. But maybe other people are thinking, well, we, we need to work out what determines the risk factors. But I, perhaps this is an approach. If you focus on risk factors, you, you, you might be able to identify um, things, targets that you can particularly go on. Um, interesting, you, you said, of course, the poor will benefit more, and, and I'm sure we'd, we'd, there's a lot of truth to that, but I think there are some interventions like tobacco control ones which have tended to widen um, differentials in mortality from smoking-related diseases, although that, that's not, not a reason for not having them. So... But I think we need to hear from some other people with some questions about measures. Right, great. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Charlotte Ye um, from AARP Services, Inc. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your excellent presentations. I just wanted to throw out a question since you've identified social connection, isolation, and loneliness being very critical for healthy aging or active aging. Um, but I noticed nobody spoke about sensory impairments, particularly hearing mm -hmm. loss, mm -hmm. which is hugely prevalent with age. Uh, we know at least in the U.S. about two-thirds of people mm -hmm. 70 and older have clinically significant hearing loss but do not get hearing aids. And is that an intervention that ought to be considered to improve active longevity and productivity and the ability to work past 65? Mm -hmm. uh, who... Lisa, or who wants to answer that? Uh, or may, maybe yeah. Ali? Let, mm -hmm. let me comment on the social isolation part. You should comment on the hearing um, part. I want to say that, that there are 
health conditions that determine social isolation, certainly mm -hmm. hearing loss, sensory deprivations, cognitive decline, influence social isolation, as well as the reverse. Um, you know, the causal diagram probably is bidirectional um, for these things. And I think a big question for us is how much do, do, um, do we want to think about prevention, that is prevention of hearing loss, prevention of high cholesterol, prevention of hypertension, hypertension um, how much we want to think about those things versus treating those things effectively. And it isn't either or. Probably it's a both and um, for these things. I tend to be on the prevention side um, and really think about what could we do to stop those things from having such a precipitous decline over time. But I think there's another perspective, and undoubtedly you're going to, the, the medical care side of things will pick this up. So we do, we do have here loss in GBD and we have vision loss too. So we have both. And uh, we have also what, uh, what the burden that they contribute dallies and we have, once you adjust for it, like hearing aid, we have that. So it takes you another, it lowers one level, unfortunately, not that much. Uh, and in GBD, in our future health scenario, you could come and then compute for each country or each location uh, what will be the burden from it given the 15 and 85 that I mentioned. So that's available. We do that. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. Can I before answer the question you asked about uh, life expectancy and healthy life expectancy? From GBD, you can take age 50 and say what's the probability mm -hmm. of death till age 60 or age 70. And you could do the same. What's the healthy life expectancy out of these 20 years, like 50 to 70? So you could do it either way mm -hmm. if you want. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, you. Michelle Jackson from Stanford University. So I have um, a question about the data uh, that is, you were bringing up. Is this up. working, this microphone? Uh, okay. Keep going? Okay. Yeah. Uh, closer. Okay. Uh, so I have a question about the data. Um, it seems that if you're taking a life course perspective, that places immense demands on data. And so I'm wondering how much progress has been made in terms of getting access to, say, administrative link data, because cohort studies are only going to be able to get you so far once you take a life course perspective and once you want to compare across, say, whole centuries of data. Okay. Not much progress, I'm afraid, uh, certainly in the countries I'm working. Uh, even in Korea, which is actually quite advanced in statistics, the, the challenge of linking administrative data to survey data is, is far too much, partly for confidentiality reasons, not for technicality reasons. But in Indonesia and Thailand, there is uh, hardly any demand and sort of desire to generate such data. In Europe, we have been much uh, more successful. But if we go away from the <coughs> idea of just the admin data, which does provide a, a whole life course picture, uh, countries are embarking on the HRS type surveys all across the world. So we are really getting fortunate that if not now, in a couple of years' time, we will have lots of very good data which would be comparable across countries, which we would have good sense of uh, understanding of what are the enablers um, and how, what factors contribute to resilience and vulnerability in old age. So gradually getting there, but admin data issues are to do with the confidentiality more. In that respect, I come back to the Titchfield City Group on Aging which has in its remit all this work to look at what countries can do in benefit from um, tapping the potential of admin data and how they can achieve, they can sort of tackle the barrier of confidentiality in that respect. Uh, yeah. So in GBD we use all kinds of data. We use administrative when available. It's not only when it's available, it's uh, the quality of data sometimes is really bad. So we rank some of the data, we give it a star system. Uh, unfortunately, as, as the professor said, we have 
like talking about the U.S., we have more data, administrative data from uh, India, China, Mexico, Brazil than the United States because of a collaboration that we have to do subnational at that level. So it varies availability and it varies quality as well. Right. Well, thank you very much. We, uh, we might have. Uh, is there? A, oh, sorry. One, someone. Hi. Is this on? Yeah. Um, good afternoon. I'm Linda Freed, and I'm uh, really appreciative of all the excellent work you're doing and fabulous talks. I wonder, um, taking Jenny's charge to us of imagining the future we want to build based on all the understanding that you've laid out 10 to 15 years from now, if this roadmap takes us to where we want to go, what will success look like? How will we know we've arrived at healthy longevity? Right, so uh, that's a challenge for each of you in about 30 seconds, please. I mean, the simplest one is to take the best country that has the best healthy life and say every other country could aim to that. Similar to what we do right now with life expectancy. We say if a Japanese woman can make it to 86.9, everybody else should make it. So if you take the best healthy life expectancy right now among the older people and say if everybody can reach that, that has lit a target that we can convince people that you have done it. One, one way. The second way is within a country, when we look at this variation, it's easier for me or you or anybody else here to convince a prime minister or a minister of uh, education or a minister of health to say you've done it in that region. Why can't you do it in that region? and then start asking this question, what's driving this variation and these disparities? So I think setting a goal that some people have done it, why can't the rest of the world do it, would be a good idea to start with. That will be my success. Let's all be there. Okay. So I think success has two elements. One of them is improving the mean so that we come close to achieving what we think I would say is healthy longevity. Um, and the second part of that is dealing with the distribution of this. So reducing inequality is prime to um, the idea of success. If we keep the mean the same or the mean improves but the distribution stays the same, I would say we haven't done so much. Okay. Let's go. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Lisa. It's, it's basically reducing those inequalities and, and this goes back to Jack's work is that some people were more successful in dealing with the challenges of aging whereas uh, others were less successful. So an ideal future scenario would be that we reduce those inequalities, that we all get the same opportunities to have engagement in the society, despite health limitations, to be able to stay engaged and active and, and, and till our last day, basically not get ill and spend lots of lots of time being ill, isolated, but stay active till the last day when we drop dead. That would be the ideal scenario in my view. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So um, can I just check how long a break I assume we want to... 3.45. Okay. So I would like to thank our, our three speakers who've given us such a lot to think about and everyone else who's participated. And we come back for more after at 3.45. So thank you. So in when we talk about economics, um, sometimes it's quite often overlooked. Um, the key concept is opportunity cost. What do we have to trade off if we want to obtain one expenditure? What other expenditure do we trade off? And we may have seen that earlier in the UK expenditure, for example, um, looking at the transport versus education versus health. So for older people, um, for looking at economics of ageing and longevity, uh, older people are our two things, producers of goods, they're working and they're still working now after the age of the, the standard definition, 65 plus, which I'll come back to later, uh, working well beyond into later years. So um, I do have a chart here to show that across uh, various countries, but in fact, actually, I'm not going to be able to show that unless somebody can 
hone in on it. Um, no, that's, that's not it. So we'll leave that for now. It just shows that over different countries, it shows the, the number, the proportion of people working beyond age 65, and that's called the proportion of older people working beyond age 65. In addition, older people are consumers of goods, so the trade-off here, the opportunity cost, is between leisure, consumption, and also hours worked. And at the moment, this is leaning more towards leisure. People are uh, going into retirement, but increasingly over the years, this is, uh, retirement is being extended and we're being encouraged to retire later. The question for economists is, is that a push? Is it discrimination? Or uh, is it maybe a push for, for health reasons? Or is it a pull? Is it desired consumption? People prefer more leisure. Or is it a pull in terms of an interaction also with, with health? So there are a lot of various interactions going on there. Also, in economics, intergeneration wealth and poverty um, is very important, not only going from older age groups downwards, but also from younger people upwards. And uh, We've also done a study, uh, one of the PhD students at University of Queensland looking at intergenerational health and she was showing that um, older, older uh, children also influence the, uh, the parents, the older parents' health, uh, mainly be through the informal caring route, so that's something we can't forget about as well when looking at data on economics. Looking at it from a point of uh, view of health, because I work in health economics mainly, um, we have to remember that cert the market forces that usually occur across markets are not really very useful. There is uncertainty of information, there is uncertainty in health, uncertainty of, of time of, of death, we c none of us can predict that. And also a symmetry of information between providers and consumers um, mean that we can't use the standard market force approach. So looking at some data here, um, we all know that, that longevity has increased. We've seen that a few times now today. And also the health income a gradient is very relevant here, was also previously mentioned. So you have seen some of this information already, uh, where we see a, a map here of, of the US and the various um, uh, life expectancy. And also then think about it in terms of, of poverty, that these are not actually causative. These are just correlations. So we have information on um, life expectancy and, and poverty, but in itself that's a very interesting uh, set of data to, to look further into and establish direction of causation. This graph you've also uh, seen to some extent in that you've seen already the, the uh, proportion of people 65 and, and how um, that's increasing, and then also uh, the proportion of children decreasing. If we look at it, from the dependency point of view, so that's the proportion of children under 15 compared to the, the working, the labour force participation uh, number and, compare, and also the, the old age dependency rate. What you see is that um, over the years, and this is focusing on the Australian data, but it's quite common across the world as well, that this graph is going to overlap and, and this, is, this is not unfamiliar territory to us here. What I should say about this is that is the... Um, the standard definition that is problematic here, in, and this is my view on the age 15, but also on age 65 plus. And again, bringing this back to earlier speakers about using the, the average approach is also problematic, but we, ha we have to have some data and start somewhere. So I would say we would need to uh, relook look again at this age dependency figure, uh, age rate, and then um, predict forward on that. So with all of those um, uh, data that we have, um, uh, we have several emergency, emerging questions in terms of economics and what costs are likely to be incurred. Remembering that we're talking about resource allocation, there's only one pot of money across the world, so we have to have these opportunity costs and trade-offs. And we think about it maybe in terms of healthcare utilisation. Quite often expenditure is looked at from a direct perspective point of view, but we also have to take into account the societal point of view and interlink all the various uh, concepts there from transport, health, housing, employment, etc. And we need to uh, look at a, a pathway for an individual from beginning to end, an individualised care pathway, and then also how we can average that out then and aggregate up into the economy. 
Health shock effects are also very relevant in, in the literature. Look, if we have a, an, an acute onset of a health condition or a recurring health condition, how will this impact on the decision to work? Or the other way around, how will um, work uh, impact on, these, on, uh, on the, these events? So reverse causation can often lead to uh, bias in correlations of data, so we need to be careful about that. A big question that emerged many years ago was, that, is it ageing per se? Is it the fact that it's bio biological ageing or simply end-of-life expenditure? So uh, Peter Sveifel did a study in 1999, the red herring approach, and looked at, and there you can see on the graph, that it's really the last quarter of, of life that the highest expenditure occurs. And you might say, well, that's old data. So more recently, uh, another study has been done by Howden and Rice and, and found the exact same in that it's really the last uh, um, stage of life. So regardless of age, it's the last stage of life that, that is important. In terms of aggregate expenditure, well, of course, because the population is aging, then the overall expenditure will have to increase. So how can we use these data and metrics to answer our questions? We've already uh, mentioned um, administrative data, cohort studies, longitudinal data, several really good longitudinal studies across the world, and I really hope now that I'm working in Australia that we will have one there as well in, in the coming future years. Uh, we also need to look at, when we're looking at uh, healthcare utilisation, workforce planning for the health healthcare services. We need to look at needs of the population. It's often quite overlooked. What are actually the health needs? People are living longer, but they're also healthier. So planning going forward, first of all, maybe not the standard 65 plus age, and also take into account the health needs and plan forward on that basis. So some of the literature, um, an example here for one of our own papers, and this um, is about the impact of cognitive and sensory impairment on healthcare use. Another good paper in the US using data looked at the impact of falls on health outcomes. So both cognition, dementia, falls are huge drivers of, of healthcare expenditure. So how can we leverage this change in populations and be successful? Firstly, I think uh, we need to embrace the rights-based approach, social model of ageing and longevity. There's a lot of heterogeneity here, a lot of diversity in, in people, and therefore um, maybe move away from averages if at all possible and have a more equitable approach. We need to develop better understanding and language surrounding ageing and longevity. Uh, think further about work and retirement. Do people want to work longer? Are they able? What distribution of people are wanting and willing and able to work? And also the language uh, surrounding older people. In, in some countries it's called aged care. Um, I, I don't think this is very appropriate. This is a sign that, that I see regularly, daily in, in Australia, and I, I, not, I don't think this is a really good signal for, for older people, and this might bring in um, a more uh, social approach, more better public understanding if we can move away from, from this sort of terminology. Even the data sets that are available are aged care data sets. Perhaps if it was older people data sets, it might incentivize more uh, younger people to enter into this area of research and make it more exciting for them as well. And we have to realise as economists that there, every option has an opportunity cost and a trade-off. There's costs and benefits to everything. Our success would be if we had healthy years that are cost and it's cost effective, independent living, sustained quality of life, so not only access to care but access to quality care, remembering that there's one pot of money, this is a resource allocation issue and we have to have trade-offs across the board. How can economics research contribute? Uh, we, we're working on, on several different agendas on this and um, Taking a quote from, from Dr. John Beard, who I know many people here are, are very familiar with, uh, in general, does the economic research conducted on ageing match the needs of policymakers and other stakeholders? And his answer in that review was no. And that, to me, I actually stuck it up on my uh, notice board in, in the office for people to see so that we can say there's a lot more research we need to do here. Research partnerships are therefore key to this success across um, universities, public sector, private sector, everybody working together to formulate the, the correct questions, use the correct data and methodologies, and then inform policy as a result. Thank you.
thank you very much. That's a, a great presentation. And that there'll be time to ask questions and discuss some of these issues after the next presentation. And I'm delighted to introduce, uh, I hope he's about to come up, um, Corey Abramson from uh, Arizona, who unfortunately couldn't be here in person, but is able to give uh, his presentation on how inequality shapes later life, lessons from the everyday experiences of aging people. Um, hi, Corey. Hi. Is my PowerPoint not showing up? Corey, we, we, we can see you. Corey, we can see and we can see the PowerPoint. Okay, I can tell <clears throat> Okay, um, first, um, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there in person for this talk, but I'd very much like to thank uh, the organizers and the Academy for inviting me to speak on this issue, which I have spent uh, most of my career working on, and that is charting how inequality shapes later life and examining what we can learn from the everyday experiences of aging people. And what I hope to do in this very brief presentation is outline the model of unequal aging that I presented in my 2015 book with Harvard University Press uh, to show how uh, our understandings of later life can be informed by the everyday experiences of older adults. At the risk of reiterating things that may have been said earlier, uh, I'd like to begin with two facts of tremendous social scientific and policy significance. The first is that uh, the population is aging in general. Um, let me take out the headphone here because I'm hearing an echo. And the second is in America and much of the world at large, this process remains tremendously unequal. So from my vantage point, it's impossible to talk about healthy and successful aging without recognizing its quality, which is that who lives long enough to uh, grow old, to receive a social security check, and who dies before they ever have the chance is profoundly unequal, both within and across societies. And in the US case, this mirrors the broader racial and sociological, uh, socioeconomic disparities in life chances that shape our opportunities from our first breaths to our final days. Now, this is probably no surprise to those in the room that there is a voluminous literature on this topic in public health, epidemiology, health economics, sociology, demography, and related disciplines that shows consistently the poor and socially marginalized have shorter lives on average, what demographers euphemistically call selective mortality, that those face physiological issues Oh, that's really bad. Uh, to their differential external conflict factors that address these environments and unsafe labor conditions, that the advantages and disadvantages of wealth and health they face continue to accumulate, at least in the U.S. days, over the life course, despite the provision of necessary measures like Social Security and Medicare, um, and that despite, um, I guess this is where I enter into this discussion, despite a, a sort of massive pool of aggregate data on these topics, comparative studies examining how this operates in the everyday world remain relatively sparse. And the sort of micro-level data that I'm going to introduce uh, produced through field research, direct observation of people in their lived settings is necessary for not only understanding the diverse and sometimes counterintuitive behaviors and experiences of the elder, but also improving trends in measurement and identifying where policy can effectively intervene and why some interventions are more effective than others. Which leads to inequalities and it. So the model that I'm going to present in a moment draws on this book project, which is based in two and a half years of field work, upwards of 2,000 hours of direct observation, uh, of older Americans in uh, settings ranging from senior centers to hospitals to homes to pool halls to bars and eventually interviews as well. And overall, what I show is that distinct 
analytically distinct, but sociologically intertwined mechanisms of inequality, health disparities, neighborhood effects, wealth gaps and individual resources, cultural understandings which reflect prior experiences with the world, and social networks create to converge what I call an unequal endgame that structures the lives and shapes the health behaviors of older Americans. And throughout, I focus on the importance of looking at how they understand this process, because if for no other reason, if people are not interested in voices, etc., how people think about the world affects how they act. And today, I'm going to provide the briefest of overviews of this model, which I expect, although ultimately is an empirical question, would be transposable outside of the U.S. context. So, a model of unequal aging. So, if I were to reduce those 2,000 plus hours of field work and the six years writing the book to five bullet points, this is what it would look like. The first thing is that it's necessary to understand later life, to understand who gets to play, right? Who gets to step onto the playing field. So, the health disparities that shape who even gets the opportunity to enter into studies like mine or these discussions. So, who survives to reach the golden years? The second factor which needs to be understood is among those who survive, what are the organizing mechanics of the game? That is, what are the shared challenges that people face? And so, I use this term to refer to the ubiquitous experiences associated with growing older, things like network shrinkage, losing friends and loved ones as one ages, being treated in ways that differ from the young, dealing with physiological changes and challenges that arise, and confronting issues that are rampant or that came up, at least in my study, like ageism. And these were issues that were not limited to a particular locale. They were seen in rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, and they actually came up as one point of commonality among those I studied. Third, recognizing that there are common challenges and something anthropologists have written on for quite some time, people face these challenges on an uneven playing field, which is defined by structural inequalities. So, some face things like arthritis, the death of a friend or loved one, a diagnosis of cancer, et cetera, with tremendous wealth in neighborhoods with great local services and robust social networks, and others face these same problems with none of these resources. And although I'm going to talk a bit more about culture and experience, really the structural issue for me is a point where we need to think most carefully about intervention. So, it's hard to go to a good doctor if there are none around. It's really hard to modify your home to reduce the likelihood of falls if you don't have money to do so or the education and cultural wherewithal to navigate the obtuse bureaucracy necessary to receive this in some alternative mechanism. However, understanding inequality does not stop there. It requires looking at team dynamics, network differences, not only who you know in the sense of breadth and density of social networks, what we most typically measure, but what that means. So, is being connected in a dense network a source of help as somebody navigates challenges or a source of stress? These are things that are starting to make their way into measurement of networks, but it's really important to understand the dynamics. And then finally, understanding the complex variation that we see requires looking at the different styles of play that people and groups deploy, what I call cultural responses that are grounded in a lifetime of prior experience. And culture, in this sense, in the sociological sense, shapes which actions and strategies are seen as desirable, reasonable, and sensible for elders, given their present realities. Now, the book as a whole presents a model that aims to be anti-reductionist, and it looks at the way these various mechanisms combine and interact. But I'm going to talk a bit more about this last point because it shows the importance of paying attention to the experiences of older adults. So, for me, this was really epitomized by a puzzle, which could be phrased as follows. Why does Jane skip chemo while Lainey goes? Now, 
First, I should note, this is not a vignette or an anecdote. This is not a composite. These people are pseudonyms in accordance with the IRB mandates, and this was seen throughout my data as a more general pattern, although it's going to be presented in this sort of narrative way. So in my study, Jane and Laney were two white women in one of the middle class areas that I spent time in. They look demographically similar uh, and face a very similar challenge, in this case, treatable early stage breast cancer. Now, Jane had a college education, she had insurance, she had a car, she had friends, and she knew, uh, she was actually quite well read about issues of cancer, that it was a bad move medically to skip chemo. And she acknowledged this on several locations. Lainey, who literally lived down the street from her, had the same characteristics. She would look identical on a number of the surveys that I've used, but despite these similar characteristics, got chemotherapy religiously and ultimately went into remission. Now, in this case, their behaviors are not reducible to the rationalist trifecta of information access and resources. In fact, most of these things have been controlled out if we were to use that language. They're in the same context, they're dealing with the same problem, and uh, in fact, they'd be indistinguishable on things like the longitudinal studies on aging, um, at least the older versions that I used back in graduate school, which was part of the motivation for the study. It's not that Jane lacked something like cognitive flexibility or sense of efficacy, but really something much more fundamental, which is that unlike in the structural examples in my book, which focus on disparate individual neighborhood resources, in this example, Jane and Laney valued fundamentally different things. And Jane was quite articulate, as was Laney, when she said she saw this idea of prolonging life as fundamentally unreasonable. I might say that, uh, you know, being 65 is not that old, but for her, she said, why would I bother living to 90 and have no fun? And for her, spending meaningful time with friends, going out, was more important uh, than prolonging this as uh, fundamentally irresponsible. Um, she, she saw it was it bordered on inconceivable. So let me clarify, you might say, how is this this how is this culture? So this is culture uh, in the sociological sense. So this is not Oscar Lewis's model of culture. I'm talking about shared understandings grounded in prior experiences with the real world that shape what people view as desirable, reasonable, acceptable responses to the present. It's not shorthand for demographic. And in fact, that's why I chose the example with Jane and Laney. It points to observable and measurable variation within something that might get compressed uh, in an error term. So again, this is not a sort of isolated story. These distinctions between preserving the body and maximizing enjoyment at the cost of longevity were seen throughout my data and in fact in my subsequent studies of terminal cancer. Um, and these sorts of preferences are key to acknowledge. However, they're not just randomly distributed psychological features. In this case with Jane, she had a great deal of uncertainty earlier in her life. Uh, she explained to me that she learned early on that nothing lasts forever. And this model, which was meaningful for navigating her world earlier in life, carried on into the later years. So it's not simply individual uh, variation, but something that reflects patterned experiences, what uh, sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, uh, I think, cleverly referred to as the objective distribution of subjectivity. Now, I could have picked, and I discussed this in the book, examples that are much more directly related to inequality. And this is where you see um, you know, this, this influence as well. So those who had encountered poor treatment or dealt with medical errors were often much more cautious or distrustful entirely of the medical establishment. And as we know in health policy, uh, that these burdens fall disproportionately on those who are poor and marginalized. Further, in the U.S. case, memories of historical events 
like the Tuskegee experiments, led many of the older African Americans in my study to avoid doctors. They had just sort of, um, you know, a very reasonable trepidation about uh, what they were doing. And some in my study saw doctors not as highly trained uh, experts or technicians, uh, but simply as, quote, hustlers who were just out to bill you. And although this sort of variation, again, based on pattern prior experiences, is often ignored, cast as misinformed or irrationality, poorly measured or reduced to a cultural error term in statistical models, these views, these orientations and motivations had a powerful impact on behavior, particularly in understanding behavior within a social strata. So to get to the conclusion, what are some of the implications or lessons for policy? First, I'd say it's necessary to look at the intersection of aging and social inequality to, do, to address either. And too often in the past, these things have been parsed out. So it's not adequate to focus on policies uh, that examine how all individuals might age successfully without looking at the broader patterns of who even gets the opportunity uh, to enter into these discussions. The second is that the interventions that we have uh, at least in the U.S. case, where I am most familiar, tend to be uh, piecemeal, even within geographically proximate locales. So the reality on the ground is that lifetimes of unequal circumstances do not dissolve with a social security check, and even those measures meant to address this issue often don't work out the way that we expect. So I have an entire chapter on this in my book, even seemingly neutral uh, measures like block grants and funding mechanisms that are competitive, in fact, tend to funnel resources into those most organized uh, neighborhoods, uh, typically those, not that they don't need them, but those who are the best off to begin with, what's called in sociology a compensatory inversion, where resources to address inequality are going to those at the top of the strata. And further, uh, these interventions take place quite often once people reach 60 or 65, when understanding unequal aging requires intervening much earlier in the life course. And then I guess the final point, because I was asked about uh, measurement, which is something that I write quite a bit about, is that charting these complex response patterns, so understanding why Jane uh, skips chemo while Laney, why, why Laney doesn't, requires looking at things like culture and experience, not simply as a sort of um, a humanitarian point, but as a scientific point and a policy point, in that the way that people think about and experience the world produces important matters, uh, important patterns of measurable variation that link prior, typically unequal circumstances, to how people navigate the uneven uh, challenges of growing old in the present. And thank you. Thank you very much, Doris. Well, that's great. So that was two really interesting presentations, which bring some new perspectives and questions. So we've got time now for contributions and questions to either speaker. And again, please introduce yourself and go to the uh, microphone. Do we have anyone? No, no, no. Okay. Right, well, I shall start. <laughs> um, I thought it was very interesting, Brenda, that you know you reminded us all that there are kind of uh, trade-offs. Um, but I wasn't quite sure where you thought you should focus the, you know, which is the most productive area to focus an intervention on. Okay, um, th that's a, a very difficult question, but you can think of it from two sides on the micro and the macro. So looking maybe at the, the macro data and, and uh, government expenditure across different departments, I was kind of struck by the, the graph earlier where there was an increase in expenditure on transport, but a reduction in, in um, expenditure on health and education. And I wondered if that was, I don't know, but I wondered if that was driven by private industry to some extent in that Obviously, if industry wants to, there wants to be a direct foreign direct investment or um, local industry might require 
better transport facilities and therefore it's a profit-driven approach. Looking at economics, it's a profit-driven approach. So that was just something that came to mind um, to me earlier on today. Um, then more on the um, individual level, how, exactly, how do you trade off? What, what is more important? Everybody, every person is important to everybody, so to people. So to say that one health expenditure, for example, has to be traded off against another is, is very difficult. Decisions, so there are health economic models that are developed to come up with um, cost effectiveness ratios per se. That's not the final answer. The final answer is more so a, um, a, a joint up decision between various players, including uh, policy, advocacy groups, um, decision makers. So economics is, is a tool that can be used to help decision makers, um, but not give the, the final decision. I'm Bridget Kelly with Burt Kelly Consulting. Um, I really appreciated how these two presentations being paired together was really two very different methodological appro approaches coming around to the same fundamental question of kind of what matters most and what to do about it. So that's just an, an observation that I appreciated. I have a pretty specific question um, for Corey. Um, the life course approach has come up throughout the day and you mentioned it as well. Are you aware of other work that's being done um, using approach kind of similar to your approach to really understand the perspectives, the varying different perspectives of people different experiencing different kinds of pre-aging inequality at earlier ages so that we could understand kind of more longitudinally how to act on the kind of information that you've gathered? Mm. Well, we, can't, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, and now I can hear myself for a minute. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a really great question. Um, and you see this in these two presentations. There's actually a, quite a bit of overlap. And that, uh, you know, looking at unequal aging from different perspectives, different vantage points, gets at different levels of uh, social reality. So aggregate demographic trends versus on the ground behaviors, and of course these are all connected. Um, and in my book, I actually use the work of epidemiologists, demographers, uh, statisticians to set this up and say, here are sort of the established trends that show inequality in the U.S. has increased since the, third, uh, the 1970s, that aging continues to be horribly unequal. It's better than it was a century ago, but you still have 10 to 15 year gaps in life expectancies from the most advantaged to the least advantaged groups. And uh, this is something that I really feel that there has been a lot of progress on in terms of measurement, you know, going beyond typical models of age period cohort effects, trying to parse out individual variation. There's a lot of work critiquing this idea of the crossover effect. And I think perhaps the best thing that I could recommend for um, a review of this would be Deborah Carr's recent book called The Golden Years. It was a Russell Sage uh, Commission project in which she sort of goes through and reviews all of the statistical evidence, um, or not all of it, but quite a bit of it, uh, on inequality and aging. And I see that not as fundamentally opposed to, but complementary to what I do, in that it's necessary to understand how these things that perhaps either fly under the statistical radar or are not as well understood as they affect seniors' everyday lives, Operate. And that's necessary for not only improving things like ecological validity and measurement, but also understanding where we could intervene. So if you take the example of Jane, and you just try to give her more and more information that skipping chemo is going to shorten her life expectancy, it's not going to do anything. In fact, it's going to push her away. Um, and so to me, this is one of the advantages of using something like an epigraphic approach is in that you're not transposing your particular view onto that of your subjects, and thus you get a better understanding of both how they experience and act in the world. But I see it as complementary. It's a micro-macro distinction that we've been talking about in not only economics, but all the social sciences for, you know, centuries. Are, are you aware of anyone doing that kind of ethnographic work about aging with younger people? With people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Operates earlier in the life course. Yeah. 
I mean, we sociologists have written extensively um, on inequality earlier on in, in terms of ethnography. So one of the classic books is Annette LaRue's Unequal Childhoods. Um, I know there are also demographers and statisticians. So Mark Hayward at UT Austin wrote a paper a while back on the long arm of childhood. And he looks at the way things like um, you know, disabilities or health challenges in early life affect what happens later in life. And likewise, um, even on the biological level, as at UCSF prior to moving to Arizona, there's a growing literature on things like telomere length that suggests things like exposure to poverty and environments, in fact, inscribes itself upon the body. But in terms of taking a diverse sample of people from birth until death, which would be, for me, the holy grail of life course studies, uh, there's nothing that I know of. There are some examples where people are followed for many decades, but usually it's not a diverse subsample of the population. And then generalizations for effects that are potentially contingent um, that don't operate the same in rich areas or poor areas um, are extrapolated from Harvard undergraduates that went to study for five decades. Uh, so that's a bit of a pet peeve of mine. Um, but yes, there are other ethnographers that look at this, you know, both in the U.S. and Europe and, you know, other, other places in the world. Hi, Linda Freed. Um, I deeply appreciate, is this working? I deeply appreciate both of the presentations um, as you help us think about how to envision um, what needs to be considered to move societies to aging equally with healthy longevity. And um, I'd, I'd be interested in both of your thoughts about what the measures are that would help us see where we're going and yet not leave people behind. Um, and Dr. Professor Gaddon, you talked briefly about the old age dependency ratio, which some could argue is an equalizer at the low end of expectations. Um, if we wanted to raise aspirations without leaving everyone behind, what would the metrics be, or leaving anyone behind, uh, what would the metrics be at a policy level that could guide us towards success? And since you're in Australia, and Australia is doing some very positive, innovative stuff, I'd be interested in how, what metrics Australia is using. Um, I, I think there may be two, two answers I can think of there. Um, looking at the, the uh, looking at any, any dependency, it's not just about maybe access to care or having metrics in terms of quantity. I think quality is also important to measure as well. And quality is really difficult to measure um, in, in the health world. Sometimes it's used in uh, looking at mortality rates or readmission to hospitals. Some, in, and these are used in the economic models. These are coarse measures, I think, of quality. So if somebody could develop a, a measure of quality that we can introduce then into models and then have that uh, on top of the um, age dependency ratios and, and look at care according to age and then also relate that to informal care as well, that would be really good. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really good is the well-being approach and that is um, having a measure of well-being. Longevity really isn't enough without healthy longevity. So if we live longer, we want, we want to have a healthy life. We want to be independent and living. So that, that is, um, again, very difficult to measure. And, and it's really great that now there are governments taking that on board to, to look at. And even in Queensland, there is a, there's now a board for uh, well-being and, and measuring well-being in, in, in all ages, actually, um, across the life course. And it also can't be just... Um, at older age, it has to be at all ages, and, and, and to introduce um, the notion of older age as, as just sort of a normality thing rather than aged care, as I said in, in my um, discussion, the, 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 con the notion of aged care I, I found quite horrific um, when, when I moved to Australia, and not realising that that's how everything was measured. I was critically reviewing articles saying, this is not right, you have to say uh, people 
uh, older people or um, older people with health problems or it's like an older person with disability. You don't say disabled person, so you don't say aged person. And um, that actually was was then published because, of course, that was the way the data is measured. So there's nothing uh, researchers can do about it. So in order to have, have good outputs that can be in, then be used to influence policy, I think the terminology might need to be a bit more globally uh, similar, harmonised, just like the longitudinal studies are harmonised across the world if the, the concepts are also harmonised. And maybe well-being is, is one way to look at that and have a really good measure of quality, quality of life, quality extended life and well-being. Corey, did you have anything to add? Maybe. Uh, I, I um, agree with a lot of those points. Developing new measures in, in, in social science. I guess I would raise um, a parallel problematic, something that you see in the US case, which is not necessarily a lack of data on things like inequality, but perhaps a lack of political will. And, Similar to this, people insurance. Was how do you we fix this? Um, and I said this is above my pay grade as a sociologist, but I'm not sure that there's an easy way. So even using the crude metrics we have, I agree that you know we're looking at averages and life expectancy and not sort of parsing pathways is problematic, but. We have tremendous data that these inequalities exist. They exist in life expectancies, advanced care planning, ADL versus IADL measures. We could include more things on attitudes and experiences. Um, but you know, here in, in this context, one of the questions is, you know, at what point do we have enough evidence for being substantial amounts of that? Uh, the, the patchwork safety net that characterizes the American uh, social welfare system has always been characterized by distinctions between deserving and undeserving. Um, so I, I hate to be a downer and, and bring this up, but um, as much as I believe in science and measurement, I don't think that that is ever going to be a sufficient way to address these issues. It's a starting point, but not an end point. And hopefully somebody um, more, more savvy than I am in terms of navigating these uh, sort of political structures might have a better way to push that forward. Is there time for another question? Yes. Yes, one. thank you. Um, so a short comment and then a question. Um, we've been discussing healthy longevity and focusing a lot on the structural determinants of our, our own health. And, and I suppose I tend to use the healthy aging framework of WHO in thinking about, so that's a lot of the focus on intrinsic capacity, so our actual intrinsic capacity. And what we've not really talked about are the inequalities and how some of these structural inequalities actually impact on our functional ability. So you can have two people who actually have the same health status in terms of intrinsic capacity, but because of living in poor housing or a community where there is you know, no transport, where the sorts of jobs that are available to them, they're not adapted to accommodate their um, health conditions, they can have very unequal experiences of ageing. And so that was sort of a comment, really, that we've focused a lot on the intrinsic, the structural determinants of health, rather than some of the structural context in which people unequally age. And so my question really was, um, both from an economic point of view, um, in terms of resource allocation, should that suggest that we should be focusing on a different allocation of resource to things like housing um, and some of these uh, measures, and also whether there were insights from your ethnographic work that sort of uh, illustrated that um, uh, those differences in terms of context. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll start there. Um, I think that's very true. Um, when you're looking at... Um, physical health impacts, uh, the, the mental health impacts, they're not two separate things, they go together. So any analysis, and up to recently, maybe a lot of economic analysis might have looked at them in isolation. Now more so, there's more evidence of, of people looking, using data on, because it's more available as well, on physical and, and mental health together. So that's within the health, the, the um, determinants. 
But then looking across uh, structural, I think also, uh, I may have said it in my, my talk, or if I didn't, I, I didn't mean to, about government data, uh, it needs to be linked across uh, departments and unfortunately we can't work, no department could work in isolation. It, to make decisions, every, everything should be brought together and that, that's really difficult as you, as you know. And it's also difficult, extremely difficult to bring data together. We, we've access in Australia to some really, really good data um, on older people in, um, in care sectors and their exit into care, their out of care, their home care packages. Looking, and we can look at the impact of that, but that's as far as we can go. We can't actually then look at the, um, the impact on primary care. We can't look at when they go into hospital, when they come out of hospital, where do they go? And that, that is something that we really want to do. But actually, we're, we're uh, prohibited at the moment from, from doing that at a micro level without the ability to have linked up data. So the, these are issues that came up earlier, but really that, that would be the holy grail for a researcher, a data researcher, to be able to have all that data together. There is so much data there at the moment that the, um, the departments actually can't, can't cope with it all, and they're really happy that, that researchers will, are willing to go in and do thesis uh, sub projects on it, but it's extremely difficult to get the access. <coughs> Thank you very much. Corey, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I, I, I actually do. Sorry, I have to take this out again. The reverb is, is sort of crazy here. Um, this is it's something that I actually spend a lot of time observing. So I didn't talk about it in my talk because it was 12 to 15 minutes. Um, but I have an entire chapter devoted to this in my book, and I also write about it in my policy work that it is, you know, one aspect of unequal aging is who survives to be in a study like mine, the physiological challenges they face. But I also point out that at a given, uh, as, as the um, questionnaire uh, mentioned, at a given level of health and illness, there are tremendous disparities, not only on the individual level, but on the neighborhood level. So I talk about this, uh, you know, two that are very clear to me are housing and transportation. So you look at something like subsidized senior housing in the U.S. When you go to the middle class neighborhoods, uh, in my study, senior housing has wide pathways. They have uh, little strings that you that want. I I think I'm for. Unfortunately, okay, okay, okay. Well, we we got. <laughs> Corey, we're kind of losing you, but we got the we got the uh, important message. I think that you were um, putting that there are environmental adaptations, but of course the. Not of course, but the how effectively they're used varies between groups, and one would assume also the cult response to them varies too. So I think we've had a, a really, really interesting afternoon. We had three great, great uh, earlier talks, and now we've had two very interesting presentations. Ah, oh, but we've got one more. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Just quickly. Um with respect to the demographics, I, I, and Linda Fried's question about what are the measures that people prefer, I have a suggestion for the commission staff. Um, I think it would be helpful for us on the commission to have a, a short document that reviews the various metrics that are commonly used. There's the old age dependency ratio, but that's static. There's the prospective old age dependency ratio, which takes changes in life expectancy into account is the RLE, which is the years left remaining in life. So you count that as opposed to the years you've already lived. And what proportion of the population has more than 15 years or less than 10 years left, et cetera, et cetera. There's a list of about eight of these or 10 of these that demographers have developed in order to try to cope with the aging societal issues. And I think it would be useful for the commission to have a, ver a deep, brief document that defines these and shows their pros and cons of each of these to see whether or not we want to 
you know, sort of put our money on one or two of these or not, but at least we shouldn't go through, I'm speaking as a commissioner here, I don't think we should go through this whole exercise and not at some point have a discussion uh, about these so that we can decide whether we want to emphasize one or another aspect of the demographics. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so as I was saying, I think we've had a uh, that thank you for this this contribution too. That's really useful. I think we've had a, a really good um, session, both the first half with three great speakers and these these last two speakers with um, Brenda and Corey, which balanced each other very well. And um, after a very short, well, I don't know if we're allowed five minutes break or something, we will then move to discussing these in more detail in our table groups. But from my perspective, there's some things that, that came out uh, or questions that, that, that still arise or things that reverberated through all of these sessions. First of all, nobody seemed to um, take the approach that age is a leveler. It used to be one of these questions in desperation you'd set your students to uh, go off and write their essays about. Everybody's talking about inequalities. Um, there's perhaps just different approaches as to whether people think we should be focusing on uh, real sort of downstream things, the kind of work or social environments that might lead to behaviors and things that uh, result in health disparities, whether people think we should focus on the, the actual um, risk factors, um, and also some interesting uh, questions raised from the floor about, well, how important should we be thinking of uh, uh, compensatory mechanisms so that the environment is more enabling of even people who, who have some um, physical health limitations or things like uh, you know providing hearing aids and, and these kind of things which are quite quite straightforward and from an economic perspective these perhaps won't address some of those major things but they're they're quite um, important and they're still certainly in the UK very badly done there's a very famous old article by someone called Muir Gray who's a sort of public health physician and now he actually writes articles in newspapers on how to get to a healthy hundred because he's he's not quite there himself but he's 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 quite approached and he he wrote this very famous article about you know how i cured incontinence with a screwdriver which was just uh, going along and kind of widening somebody's bathroom door and there are quite a lot of those things that may be uh, are quite quite easy to do then we've had uh, discussions about the importance of different measures, and I, I think it would be a very good idea to have some kind of glossary, a compendium of, of all of these things, because things like even healthy life expectancy, of course, it depends which measure of health uh, you're using, the same with disability-free life expectancy. And people like these because for policymakers they sound very easy, but actually you're quite often giving them completely the wrong information because they're based on a, <laughs> the actual raw disability measure is not very good or something like this. So I'm sure that would be useful. But also bearing in mind, as uh, Corey has emphasized, that there's an important cultural dimension to this as to how people perceive their health and well-being. And I'm sure we, um, I think this was raised too from the floor about how do younger people view, view aging and the things that people change and adapt. So some people um, you can find in studies who perhaps a younger person might consider to have a rather poor life circumstances, perhaps they effectively are housebound and yet they appear to have a very good quality of life. Whereas other people, a much less, can't have a much higher emphasis on personal autonomy or something and find any kind of reliance on other other people or systems to be um, one that limits their, their quality of life. And then, uh, so we've heard all these things about distributions, inequalities, um, linked lives, what happens to one person affects um, somebody else. 
Um, so I think we've, we've, I feel that we've learnt an awful lot and had some really wonderful presentations and things, but we've also got an awful lot more <laughs> to discuss in our table groups and in, in the rest of the meeting. So thank you all very much, and thank you to all five of our, our speakers. That's great.